I'm a single dad to a wonderful daughter who's been the light of my life from the very moment she was born. It would be an understatement to say things weren't easy after her mother passed, but we made it through the grief together and that had strengthened our family bond. My daughter had since grown and flown the nest and we've always had a great relationship, but when she was growing up I found myself gripped by fear that I'd end up losing her too. Sometimes that terror of loneliness was just background noise, something I managed to ignore by busying myself. Other times it was overwhelming and I'd become so overly cautious and protective of her that sometimes I feel like I failed her as a father. She missed out on a few field trips, a handful of her friends' birthday parties, and a whole lot of play dates, all because I was just too nervous to leave her alone in a place that I wasn't familiar with. It got to the point where, around the time of her 13th birthday, I realized that I'd never left her home alone before. Even when it came to short grocery store runs, I'd insist that she'd hit pause on whatever she was doing to join me on whatever errand I was running. That worked when she was younger, but then the older she got, the more she appeared to resent being attached to my hip. The whole thing culminated in a small argument one day, when she was insistent on me leaving her at home so she could finish off some homework while she was still feeling studious. My words, not hers by the way. I won the argument, and she had a face like thunder during the ride to the grocery store, but I started to wonder if I should be relaxing my policies as she got older. A few months later, after a long period of reflection, I walked into her room and told her that I was making a quick run to Target to pick up a few things. She groaned, slumped off her chair, and moved to put her shoes on. Then, with theatrical timing, I told her that I would be going alone. She smiled, the kind of smile that brings a lot of joy as a parent. It was a smile that marked a milestone in both of our lives. She was growing up, and it was time to start giving her some space. I know it might sound pretty dumb, but I actually got a little emotional while climbing into the driver's seat and edging out of our driveway. The whole kids growing up so fast thing is for sure overused, but it's overused because it's true. By the time I got to Target, I'd fought back all the tears and after repeatedly telling myself everything is going to be fine, I actually began to feel a semblance of calm. Then, as I'm walking up and down the aisles, picking up odds and ends, I feel my phone start to vibrate in my pocket. I pull it out and see it's my daughter calling me, probably to ask me to pick something up for her. I press the green button, bring the phone to my ear, and before I can even say anything, all I can hear is screaming and crying. I just left the shopping cart where it was, sprinting out of the store and back towards my car. Then as I was driving back to the apartment, I tried calming her down and getting her to tell me what was happening. She just kept saying, I don't know, I don't know, I think someone shot a gun. My next question was, are you hurt? And when she replied, yes, I just tossed my phone down, got both hands on the wheel and then started speeding back towards our apartment. Minutes later, I was only two blocks from my apartment when I saw flashing lights in the rearview mirror. I felt sick as I realized that I was faced with two distinct choices. Run from the cops to get to my daughter and risk getting myself shot or something when I jumped out of my car to run inside, or pull over, try my best to explain the situation and temporarily condemn my daughter to her fate. To some, that might seem like a real conundrum, but to a parent, absolutely zero thought is involved in the decision making. You help your child there are no other options. I never thought that I'd ever get into an actual police chase in my life. Aside from a few parking tickets, I've always walked the line and stayed firmly on the right side of the law, so the fact that I was gunning it away from a cop car, praying they'd understand my reasoning, it was surreal in the extreme. I raced the two blocks back to my apartment, skidded into my driveway, then got out of the car with my hands in the air as the cops raced in behind me. I remember them jumping out too, taking cover behind their open doors, and pointing guns or tasers at me as I screamed at them, I'm so sorry, my daughter's in trouble, I couldn't stop, I can't stop. I kept repeating my story as one of the cops approached with his gun drawn, and I don't know if it was the tone of my voice or the look in my eyes, but all of a sudden, he stops and asks me where my keys are. 
Recognizing that he was giving me the benefit of the doubt, I told him that my front door keys were attached to my car keys and that they were still in the ignition of my car. He told his partner to keep an eye on me, then he grabs my keys after shutting off my engine, then basically runs into my apartment to look for my daughter. That was a truly terrifying few minutes for me, because I had no idea what the cops were going to find. I didn't know if it was an intruder still in the apartment, or if all they were going to find was my daughter's body, and waiting for the answer with a gun pointed at me felt like an eternity. When the cop emerged moments later, leading my daughter out of the apartment, it was probably the purest, most overwhelming sense of relief I've ever felt. But when I saw that she had blood all over her, I begged the cops to call an ambulance to get her to the hospital, and the one cop who went inside said that he'd wait with her until the EMTs arrived, but the other guy was going to have to arrest me for fleeing a traffic stop. The cop was just doing his job, I know that. There's no way that he could have just let me go for starting a car chase no matter how small it was, but he gave me dignity of just sitting me in the back seat of the squad car while it was parked across the street. Me getting arrested like that obviously made the situation even more distressing for my daughter, who had no idea why I was being held in the back of that squad car, but after she calmed down a little, one of the cops checked her injuries and came over to tell me that she'd be okay and that all her injuries were basically superficial. I asked him if it was 100% sure because my daughter had mentioned something about a gunshot when she called me, but the cop was able to assure me that she had no gunshot wounds, just a bunch of glass cuts to her upper arm and lower cheek. Again, I felt this overwhelming sense of relief and for the second time that day, I found myself fighting back tears. A few minutes later, the EMT showed up, then after a quick examination of my daughter's injuries, she was driven to the hospital to get stitches. That was my cue to be taken to jail, but I was out in bail in just a few hours later after being given a court summons for fleeing the traffic stop. I immediately drove over to the hospital to pick up my daughter, who by then had a line of stitches along the worst of her wounds, which ran along her jawline. On the way back to our apartment, I got her to tell me exactly what had happened to cause her injuries, as obviously I still didn't understand how a gunshot had caused glass injuries. She said that she was making a sandwich and getting a glass of water and had just placed the glass of water down in front of her on our little breakfast nook when it suddenly exploded. The explosion of glass was what caused the cuts on her arm and face and right around the same time, she said that she had heard a loud bang coming from the apartment next door. Now without boring you with too much detail, the layout of our kitchen is such that there's no way someone could have actually aimed a shot at her, but when I got back home and spoke to the cops who were still there, all became clear. They had already arrested our neighbor in the apartment next door as the angle of the bullet holes in our kitchen showed exactly where the shot had come from. Apparently, the guy was drunk, or at least some other kind of intoxicated, and had decided to clean his guns without checking if they were actually loaded or not. He admitted to the whole thing, and apparently broke down crying in the cop car, thinking he'd seriously hurt someone after hearing all the screaming. He caught a reckless endangerment charge, which he was eventually convicted of, but he didn't see any jail time for it. He only has his guns confiscated after receiving a suspended sentence and mandatory substance counseling, and call me biased, but I think that he should have been handed a whole lot more. Me, on the other hand... I pled no contest to the traffic stop thing, but after the judge learned of the circumstances and how they were related to the other guy's reckless endangerment charge, I only had to pay $500 mandatory fine instead of having my license suspended for a year on top of that. According to my attorney, it was about as good a deal as I was ever going to get as obviously no one is above the law, and the cops take fleeing traffic stops very, very seriously. In the end, it was clear to both me and my daughter that we had both dodged a major disaster, and it was something that I was very thankful for. But just as I'd gotten comfortable with giving my daughter some space and privacy in her life, the anxiety of losing her somehow came back a hundred times stronger, and it wreaked havoc on my mental health. For the first time in my life, I actively sought out therapy on my sister's recommendations, 
and I have to admit that weekly sessions put a serious dent in my paranoia and overprotectiveness. I never turned out to be one of those hands-off, carefree parents. I'm still not, even now that she's moved out and living in some fancy apartment downtown. I'll always be her father. Not a thing in the world is going to change that, but this also means that until the day that I'm in the dirt, I'll always be scared. I'm a 15-year-old female, and I live with my parents and my older brother. He's 18 years old. My parents work till late evenings, and most of the times I'm home alone. Sometimes my brother is home with me. My family used to take care of a mentally disabled person by giving him food, old clothes, and some other things. Sometimes he used to behave perfectly like a normal person. He was not that ill that I knew of. I knew him since I was 10. He had no family, and he used to live with the people that he was working for, basically cleaning and such. One evening, it was almost 7 p.m., and my brother and I were home alone. My brother was sleeping on the couch, and I heard a knock on the door, and I heard him, let's call him George for the sake of the story, calling my mother. I opened the door, and I let him know that she wasn't home. He had slightly moved in, and as soon as he saw my brother was sleeping there, he stopped, and he started whispering and asking me for my phone number. I was completely shocked. Why would he need my number? And if it was for some genuine reason, why was he whispering as if he didn't want my brother to hear it? I immediately felt uneasy, and I made him leave by telling him to come on a Sunday to meet my mother for whatever reason he came for. He left. Fast forward two to three months later, and I was again home alone. My brother was at my uncle's home for my older cousin for the night. My mom and dad had to go see my grandma at the hospital, and my dad would be staying there, and my mom wouldn't be back until 10 p.m. Now, I was in my bedroom watching some YouTube videos, when I again heard knocking at the front door. It was around 8 p.m., and I thought my mom's probably back early, so I went to unlock the door, and when I did, it was him, George. He was standing there at the door with an evil grin on his face. I was about to shut the door when he said he needed some water to drink as he was thirsty. As I have known him since I was a child and never really felt any danger with him except the last time, I told him to wait there and I went to grab a glass of water for him. When I came out of the kitchen, I saw he was already inside our living room standing there and I was kind of scared and confused. I gave him the glass, and he tried to hold my hand. I was almost paralyzed with fear. He started coming closer to me, and he almost tried to touch me inappropriately when I then slapped him. He then told me that he wanted to have sex with me, and he would then immediately leave after that. I was disgusted, and I told him I was going to call the police. After that, he left, and I told my mother when she came back home about everything that happened. To my knowledge, she told my father about it, and I don't know what they did to him afterwards, but I never did see him again. To this day, I still can't believe how my family took him in, and he could behave like that. He truly was a sick f that didn't deserve our hospitality. My name is Angelo, and I'm 16. Around three months ago, my parents left me alone due to them heading to a wedding. I live with my family and dogs, Coco, Marshall, Skye, and Rubble. Marshall and Skye are pit bulls, so I had nothing to fear if someone broke in. A couple of hours after my parents left, I let Marshall and Skye outside to do their business. I heard barking outside, and I went to check on them when I saw a woman who was around five foot five and in her late thirties standing on the other side of the fence looking at my dogs. You have such beautiful dogs. Can I pet them? The woman said to me. 
I was about three feet away from the fence, but I could smell cigarettes coming off her clothes. Sorry, they don't really like being pet, but thanks for the compliment. I said to the woman while hurrying my dogs inside. She then gave me this glare, a glare that still haunts me to this day. When my dogs were inside, I made sure the doors were locked and I checked that the woman was gone. When I didn't see her, I rushed all of my dogs to a room that was the farthest away from the backyard door. I texted my mom that there was a strange woman outside trying to pet our dogs. Now, I forgot to mention, but there's apartments right next to our neighborhood, and we had a fair share of people stopping and looking at our dogs. But something about this woman made me and my dogs feel really unnerved. My mom said that they wouldn't be heading home anytime soon, but to be safe. A few minutes later, I had heard the doorbell, and all of the dogs went crazy. My bedroom is fairly large, but all of the dogs moving around was crazy. I decided not to bother to see who was outside and to just stay with the dogs. Me and the dogs were watching a movie, but I then heard clicks in my window. I paused the movie, and I was starting to freak out internally, wondering if it was that same lady trying to break in. And then I heard a loud crash. I mustered up the courage to look out the window. I pulled back the curtains, and what I saw was shocking. I saw that same woman breaking into my neighbor's house. I quickly closed the curtains and called 911 on the phone. I stayed quiet as to not alert the woman. The operator said that the police would get there in about two minutes, but I then heard a shriek coming from my neighbor's house. I looked out my window and I saw my neighbor attacking the woman who was then screaming at the top of her lungs. I was still on the phone, and I had told the operator that my neighbor was now fighting against the woman. By now, the police got there, and they had to taser the woman for how violent she was. She was spouting swears that would make a sailor blush, and she was moving uncontrollably. The police took a knife and what looked to be a gun away from the lady. She started to say that she was going to kill me and my dogs and burn my house down. I think she was high and thought that my neighbor's house was mine due to how similar the houses looked. I was stunned, looking out my window, while the thought of what that woman would do to me and my dogs if she got me. I then started to cry, holding my dogs close to me. I didn't know what to do, so I kind of just sat there until I fell asleep. I had heard my parents opening my door, saying they were home. I didn't know what to say, but I then told them to talk to the neighbors next to us. Days went by, and now they insist that I can't stay home alone anymore. I can't get the image of her glare out of my head, and I now sleep with both of my pit bulls just to feel safe. I know I'll be safe now, but knowing what that woman was capable of doing just scares me. If that woman didn't break into my neighbor's house and broke into mine instead, I just know me and my dogs would be dead. Stay safe out there. For reference, I'm a 23-year-old female. The story took place when I was 17 years old and home alone when my parents took a trip out of the U.S. to Toronto, Ontario. We lived there for three years for my father's job when I was a child, so they were visiting old friends that they had made when we lived there. My older brother was out of state in college at the time, so I was alone for the week. It was a Friday night, and one of my good guy friends was supposed to spend the night with me so that I wasn't alone for the weekend. Something came up and he had to return home for the night, leaving me home alone. I wasn't worried or nervous at all because I'd been staying home alone since I was 12 years old, and as I got older, I had spent several nights alone. My friend ended up leaving at around 10 that night. I texted my mom letting her know that he had to leave and that I'd be alone for the night now. She told me it was fine but to just be careful and make sure the alarm was on. So I got ready for bed and I decided to sleep in my parents' bedroom 
because they had a huge TV in their room with cable access, which I didn't have in my room. I turned the house alarm on, got in bed, and started looking for a movie on cable to watch. My dog was lying on the bed with me, so I knew she couldn't have done anything to cause what happened next. About an hour had passed, and I was flipping through the channels when my house alarm suddenly went off. I immediately looked at the alarm unit by the bedroom door and saw the red light was flashing on and off. I froze. It was a very loud and repetitive beeping sound. I think it took me about 15 seconds just to process what was happening. Didn't the alarm just go off by itself? I thought. There's no way a door opened. Immediately, I started thinking of anyone and everyone I knew that could have possibly opened one of the doors to my house with a key. You know, since all of the doors were locked. I knew my brother wasn't coming home for the weekend. I knew it wasn't my friend who had recently left because I had just received a text saying he was home. I went through all of my friends that I could think of, and every single one of them was either out of town or busy. I knew none of my neighbors would have opened any of the doors either. I went through all of this in my head in that 15 seconds that I was frozen on the bed. Finally, I snapped out of it and I ran to my parents' bedroom door, closed it, and then locked it. I refrained from turning the alarm off because I knew that it automatically calls the police once it hits one minute of going off, and I was also thinking the loud alarm would scare away whoever just broke into my house. After I locked the door, I went to my mom's night table and took out a revolver that she kept in there just in case of emergencies like this one. Now, I'm only about 5 foot 4, and I knew that if anyone came through that door had the intention of hurting me, they would have easily succeeded. I wasn't taking any chances. I took out the gun, made sure it was loaded, and took the safety off. I held the gun up and I pointed it at the door but kept my finger off the trigger, as you're supposed to do until you know for a fact you're going to shoot. I couldn't believe that I was holding a gun and pointing it at something, and possibly someone, with the intention to shoot if they proved to be dangerous. I sat there mentally preparing myself to shoot whoever managed to get through the door. This is something I never thought I'd have to do. I remained calm and I didn't let my emotions or fear get the better of me. I knew I needed to stay quiet and keep my head clear in case something actually happened. I was kneeling on the floor in this position for what felt like forever, but I'm sure only about two minutes truly passed. The alarm was still going off, and I decided that I would call 911 just in case the alarm system malfunctioned and didn't call the police. I dialed 911, explained to them everything that was going on, and they sent two police officers my way. The dispatcher stayed on the phone with me until the cops got there. They checked the exterior perimeter of my house before knocking on the front door. I turned off the alarm and then put the gun away. I opened the front door and talked to the officers. They told me they found no sign of a break-in on the outside of the house. They asked me a few questions about what happened and I explained everything to them. They again asked me if I wanted to do a sweep of the interior of the house just to see if anyone had broken in and possibly hid somewhere. Looking back, I cannot believe how stupid my answer was. No, I think it's okay now. The cops assured me they would remain in the area and they told me not to hesitate to call back if anything else happened. I walked them out, locked the door behind them, and went back into my parents' room. I made sure my dog wasn't spooked at anything that happened, being that she's a 20 pound cocker spaniel and not exactly the guard dog type. I then proceeded to finally call my parents and then tell them what happened. My mama has always been an extremely calm person, so she didn't panic, and I guess I have to thank her for my calm attitude during all of this, because I'm along like her in that sense. My dad, however, was very clearly worried about me, being that I was his young daughter home alone. They asked me if I was okay and if I wanted them to come home early. I told them that wasn't necessary and I'm sure nothing like that would happen again since the alarm probably scared them off. 
I hung up the phone with my parents, and I realized that I hadn't turned the alarm back on. So I went to the alarm system, entered the code, and pushed set. Nothing happened. It wasn't turning back on. I was confused at first, but then I realized the alarm doesn't turn on unless every door in the house is completely shut. My heart dropped. Shit! I muttered out loud. I had the realization that I had to now go around the house and look for what door had been opened and set the alarm off in the first place. This is when I truly realized how stupid I was to tell the police officers no when they asked if I wanted them to search the interior of the house. I went back in my mom's night table and picked up the gun, again mentally preparing for the worst. I then went to every door on the ground level of my house, holding the gun in both of my hands. I finally made it to the hallway where the door entering our garage was, and it was there that I saw the door to the garage had been left wide open. Chills went through my body at the thought that someone had actually tried to break in, and they succeeded. Now we had two ground level windows in our garage, so someone coming through there to get into the house was not far fetched. I turned the light on in the garage and held the gun in front of me. I looked at the two windows in the garage and there didn't seem to be any sign that they were opened. I immediately shut the door to the garage, locked it, and tried turning the alarm on again. It worked this time. After this, I went through the entirety of the house with the gun in hand to check if anyone had hidden anywhere. I prayed the entire time that I wouldn't find anyone and that I really wouldn't have to use that gun. And to my relief, I found nothing and no one. I slept with my parents' bedroom door locked that night and with the revolver under my pillow for the rest of the week. When my parents returned home from the trip, my father inspected the windows in the garage to see if they had been forced open or anything like that. As I figured, there was no evidence of a forced entry. My parents concluded that the door to the garage must have not been shut all the way and a gust of wind came from outside through the garage and then swung the door to the house open, causing the alarm to go off. We never figured out what actually happened that night. Since then, I have had one more experience with a possible break-in when I was in college and I came home for the weekend. That story wasn't as scary, but I was alone again and my parents were doing the same thing during the first time, visiting friends in Canada. I'm now 23 years old. Six years have passed since that night, and whatever it was, whatever truly happened, well, it continues to be the scariest night of my life. I can't even bring myself to imagine what would have happened if we didn't have that alarm system, and if I didn't have my mom's gun to feel safer. Although nothing bad ended up actually happening, I advise everyone hearing this story to always make sure your home has an alarm and to always, always keep a gun in the home to protect yourself. Back in the day, I used to work for the National Trust up in Scotland. It was a really lonely job with a lot of it spent either driving long distances or walking around the highlands in dire weather conditions. At work, I used to drive around this big 4x4, but off-duty, I had to use my own car, which was absolutely crap. So this one Saturday, I planned to drive back down to England for my mom's birthday. Me and my boyfriend had this whole big thing planned for her. I'd drive down in the morning, help get set up, then I'd go and pick mom up for the big surprise. I was massively excited about it and massively confident that my mum would be over the moon with it. What I wasn't confident about was the ability of my poor little Nissan Micra to get me there without giving me trouble. I was driving through the highlands, absolute arse end of nowhere and all, and the engine started making some really unhealthy noises. I pulled over to the side of the road, but I couldn't work out what was wrong. I thought I'd be able to get it to a garage and risk being a little bit late. But when I got back in my car and tried starting it up again, nothing. The engine was trying to turn over, just never coming to life, and no matter how hard I tried or what little tricks I tried to pull, I just couldn't get the car to start. These days, I'd have just pulled up an app and had a bloke out for repairs or a tow within an hour or so, 
But back then, in the age of flip phones and spotty mobile reception, breaking down in the middle of nowhere could be a huge pain in the bottom. I tried the engine a few more times while mentally preparing myself to actually get out and walk. This was in the middle of November, by the way, so it was absolutely freezing as it was, but then the highland gales meant the idea of walking anywhere was grim beyond belief. I fought it for as long as I could, but in the end, I fastened up my coat, whacked on my hat and gloves, and got out of my car to face the cold. The plan was to walk to the nearest anything, which hopefully had a phone or someone capable of engine repairs, but then no sooner had I started walking, but a car suddenly appeared in the distance. Each side of the road was lined with trees, and the road kind of snaked off in the distance, so the car's appearance took me by surprise at first. I actually said a prayer to myself that whoever it was would pull over for me, and when they did, I thought those prayers had been answered. But at the risk of sounding a bit melodramatic, I don't think it was God that answered my prayers that day, rather than his opposite number downstairs. Anyways, the car pulls over and this quite friendly looking middle-aged man rolls down the window and asks if I'm alright. I explain the situation, tell him where my car is, and he says that depending on how bad the damage is, he might be able to get his mate to come and fix it on the cheap. I just about danced a little jig that I was so happy. Then he invites me into his car and gives me a lift back to mine. We made a bit of small talk after I noticed his English accent and we both swapped stories explaining why we were both up in Scotland. After we pulled up behind my car, he pulled out his mobile and started texting someone, apparently the person who was going to come fix my car. When I asked him, he explained that up in the Highlands, it was much better to send texts with that little signal you could muster. It was a little slower in terms of response time and all, but the message actually went through loud and clear instead of garbled and spotty. He told me not to worry though, as his mechanic friend worked Saturdays and was probably close to a phone. Those of you in your 20s might not remember the ritual of holding your plastic brick of a phone high above your head to try and force a text message through, but after a minute or so of that, my Highland Samaritan assured me that the text had both been received and read. Everything was looking hunky-dory. All I had to do was to be patient and hope for the best. Within a few minutes, the kind stranger's phone had buzzed and he reported that his mate was on the way although he wouldn't be arriving for another 20 minutes or so. 20 minutes I could deal with, and if the guy could get me to my mum's surprise party on time, the one I'd spent a month planning, I was willing to give him everything I had in my wallet. But then, as I sat waiting with the bloke, still making the same small talk, I noticed that he changed some minor detail in his story. I won't bore you with the ins and out of it, but he basically told me his business was in one place, and then about 10 to 15 minutes later, he told me it was based somewhere else. I didn't jump on the sudden change of detail or anything, I mean, a business can have more than one branch, can it? And people misspeak all the time, so I'm not exactly going to act all Sherlock Holmes on a bloke who's supposedly doing me a favor, am I? That was the first red flag, you might say. One I didn't really acknowledge until after the event itself. It was only the second that actually caught my attention. After a brief lull in the conversation, the man asked if anyone was expecting me. He used that exact same phrase too, expecting you, and I must have given him a funny look or something because he clarified with, you know, have you got any plans later? I started telling him about my mom's party, how I'd been planning it for ages, how my whole family expected me to be there, and instead of showing any interest or enthusiasm whatsoever, he sort of nodded and started staring off into the distance like he was thinking about something. That wasn't what got me though. It was how he'd phrased the question. Was anyone expecting me? And then considering he was apparently just bringing his mate to fix my car and I hadn't heard what they'd said to each other. It all added up to a really bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. Call it a woman's intuition, but I knew I had to do something, anything to try to get ahead of what I feared the most. I asked the guy how long his mechanic friend is going to be, and after his long and contemplative state, he snapped right back into his friendly. He checked his phone and then told me, it seems like it's only going to be a few more minutes. So I put my little plan into action. I told the bloke that I had to grab a few things from my car just in case it needed a tow or I had to go anywhere, 
then slipped out of his car and walked towards my own. Once I was there, I put on a show of looking for things and when what I was doing in actual fact was delaying time until his mechanic friend arrived. If it was some bloke in overalls driving his work van, then yeah, I probably had nothing to worry about. But anything else, I'd put phase two of my plan into action. I kept at it for a few minutes, fishing around for absolutely nothing while keeping my eyes glued to the road behind us. Then lo and behold, a big white van comes from around the bend a few hundred yards behind us and starts pulling in behind the stranger's car. The van was all white, no marking on it at all, and it looked brand new. On top of that, there were two people sitting in the cab, not just one as I'd been expecting. Like I said, if everyone's intentions were good, then me acting a bit paranoid wasn't going to do anyone any harm. The mechanic and his friend might think that I was a bit weird, but weird I can live with. What I couldn't live with was the feeling I was walking into some kind of trap. The moment the van started to pull in behind the stranger's car, I hurried back to him and told him something like, I'm just going to nip for a wee. I'll be back in a few. At that, I scurried off into the trees at the side of the road and kept myself crouched and out of sight as if I was actually having a wee. But in actual fact, I'm just watching the seemingly kind stranger and his friends to make sure that they didn't have anything planned. I stayed where I was, telling myself I wouldn't move until I got a good look at the two blokes who'd just pulled up in the van, but the minutes ticked by and no one moved. Eventually I heard the stranger's voice calling me from the side of the road. He sounded friendly at first, and just let me know that the blokes were working on my car. Only thing was, I could see a bit of my car, and there was no one standing near it. I still felt like I was going half mad at this point, that I'd gotten myself into a tizzy and had completely overreacted. Then, right as I told myself that I was going to feel very silly after this if the guys really were there just to fix my car, the stranger's tone of voice changed dramatically. That alone sent a chill through me, but what truly terrified me was when he used my name. At no point in our conversation had we ever swapped names or introduced ourselves formally. I know that sounds a bit mental, since I was sitting with the bloke for the better part of a half hour, but my mind was on other things, and evidently his was too because he never bothered to introduce himself either. I know there's always a chance that I let it slip during our chat and just not remembered it, but I certainly didn't know his name, which made it all the more frightening when he told me to show myself. He made it clear that if I didn't, it wouldn't be good for me and that I might actually get to my mum's party on time if I just did as he told me. Squatting down among the clump of trees, trying to stay out of sight of those not-so-benevolent strangers, they made for the scariest few moments of my entire life. I didn't think it was possible to get any more frightened than that, but I was wrong. Suddenly I heard an engine start up, but I knew from how healthy it sounded that it wasn't mine. The next thing... I see the stranger's car drive off, and that's the first stranger who picked me up, not the two strangers in the van. I thought that might mean that the van was about to drive off too, so I poked my head out from behind the trees a wee bit to get a better look. That's when I see a man, wearing a balaclava, walking through the trees with his head on a swivel like he's searching for me. Remember what I said about being wrong regarding how scared I could be? I can actually remember most of the stuff that happened, but after seeing that guy in his mask, quite obviously searching for yours truly, my memory actually gets a bit spotty. I know I just ran, further and faster and harder than I ever ran in my life. I remember being sick a bit when I couldn't run any further, and I remember many cars passing me before a driver finally bothered to stop to see if I was actually okay. I also remember being frightened out of my wits that The first stranger or the guys in the van would come across me, but thankfully that didn't happen. Instead, I was driven to a police station where I gave a statement. After that came a trip to a mechanics which resulted in me finding out my car wouldn't be roadworthy for at least 24 hours. After that, I got a room and a bed and breakfast, got myself a late lunch, and cried on the phone to my mom up in my room. I actually think it was the single worst day of my life. I let my mum down, had a dip into my savings to pay for engine repairs, and it was just a complete nightmare of a day. 
and to top it all off, I almost got kidnapped or murdered as well. I just didn't think things like that happened in real life, or if they did, I certainly didn't think it had ever happened to me. I was able to give a really detailed description of the first guy along with what car he was driving, but as for the other two men, I didn't have much to say aside from what their van looked like. The police promised that they'd do all they could, and they even got the first guy in for questioning, but given that he hadn't actually broken any laws, they were unable to charge him with anything. The police had asked him about the masked men in the white van, but he just claimed he didn't know what they were talking about. According to him, he tried to do a favor to a young woman whose car had broken down, and the next thing, she's off into the woods in a blind panic. They let him go, but I know he was involved in it, and I know he only let me see his face because he thought I was a done deal. But if that's the case, how many other women and girls have his tactics worked on? And that's the thought I find myself living with after all these years. I can be thankful and grateful in whatever else I can be that I didn't end up a victim that day, but I can't be the only one. There have to be more. Girls who didn't get away. And it haunts me to wonder where they are now. I am a proud Floridian. At the time of this story, early 2000s, I was going to college in South Florida, and I lived with my family in my hometown located in the Panhandle. It's about a seven hour drive up through Central Florida to get between my school and my house so I mostly went home just for the holidays. It was the Thanksgiving of my junior year, and I was excited that I had been able to rearrange my midterms to be able to leave campus three days ahead of everyone else. I was expecting to beat the masses of traffic, and I was hoping for a quick trip back home. My roommates wanted to have one last meal together before we all left for break. So we all met up at the campus dining hall around 4 p.m., and I set off on my journey around 5.30. Around 10 p.m., I was just a bit more than halfway there. I always stopped at this mom-and-pop kind of diner by the side of the highway to grab some food, use the restroom, and called my dad to let him know that I was okay. I didn't have a cell phone back then. Well, I hadn't been through here since summer, and unfortunately the place went out of business. So, a bit bummed out that I wasn't going to be able to get my chocolate chip pancakes, I just kept going. There really wasn't much build up around there at the time. So when I saw signs for a rest stop in, of all places on God's green earth, some bumfuck town called Alachua, I went and parked directly under the streetlight for safety and used the facilities, called my dad on the payphone, etc. I didn't see anyone else there except for a very exhausted looking woman who asked me for directions, saying that she was with her husband and two small children and they had made a wrong turn trying to get to Disney. Alachua is about 150 miles from Disney World. So I left the rest area and was walking back to my car when I noticed a beat up, unmarked, bluish gray work van parked very close to the driver's side door of my 95 Honda Civic. I thought, yeah, okay, that's pretty weird. Of course, it had Florida tags on it. So it couldn't have been the lady I talked to before. I distinctly remember she said she was from Virginia. I turned around and hightailed it back to the rest stop, promptly running into some random middle-aged guy who had two little boys with him. It turns out that it was his wife that I had spoken to before. She emerged from the bathroom a second later. I told him what was going on with the van, and how I didn't know what to do. He said that he would go and check it out. So he left the kids with his wife, then walked up to the driver's side door of the van. He stood there for a moment before speaking. His voice awkwardly quivered, but I could hear him yelling from where we were standing, about a hundred feet away. Uh, excuse me gentlemen, we've already called the police. So I'm going to have to politely suggest that you get out of here. He then ran back to us, grabbed his wife and kids, and pointed to me with a swift, You, come on, let's get in the car, now. And we all ran back to his car together. 
very confused, sitting in the back seat of a stranger's SUV while he went and used the payphone, presumably to call the police. Meanwhile, the van pulled out of there. I had never seen someone get the out of there quite like they got the out of there. They ran up onto the curb on their way out. They burned rubber. It was almost comical. The cops got there and I found out what happened. The man went to go check out the van and he could see inside pretty well because I had parked under the streetlight. The first thing he noticed was that all the seats except for the driver's seat had been removed. There was someone sitting in the driver's seat and another guy hiding in the back with a tarp laid out and a bunch of other random items back there that I couldn't immediately identify. Neither of the men were reading a newspaper or a map. They were both apparently just sitting there, waiting. Still makes me sick just thinking about it. This happened when I was 14. I was home alone one weekend while my parents were at a work convention out of state. I was in my bedroom playing Rocket League with two of my friends. To clarify, they weren't in the room with me. I was talking to them on my headset. During the game, I heard a thump from downstairs. This wasn't unusual because I have two cats who wrestle each other sometimes, and they often make a lot of noise while they're doing it. So I assumed that's what it was and resumed my game but I slightly turned on the volume to hear if the noise persisted. Two minutes later, I hear another thump, followed by what sounded like a grunt. Hang on, guys. I think I hear something downstairs. Go check it out. We'll be here when you get back. I began to make my way downstairs, thinking that my cats were wrestling rougher than they usually do. But as I got about halfway... I froze. I could hear what sounded like men whispering to each other, coming from the living room. I crouched down to get a small peek into the living room and saw three men, dressed in black. I felt my chest sink in when I saw them. I slowly went back upstairs, and of course, like in a typical horror film, the very last step made a loud creak. The entire house went silent. I knew that they heard it. Thinking on my feet, I quietly went to my room and threw on my headset. Guys, I need you to call 911. There are three men inside my house. W what? Look, I don't have time to explain. Just call the cops and send them to my house right now. I'm being 100% serious. I then threw my headset on the bed. I could hear footsteps coming up the stairs. I had to think fast. I knew that if I locked myself inside my room, they would know where I was. So I closed the door and snuck over to my parents' room, leaving the door open so they wouldn't think to check it. I know the logic is flawed, but I had to think fast. Five seconds later, I heard a pair of heavy boots hit the wooden floor accompanied by two more sets. I then heard them get louder as they came down the hall and stopped outside my bedroom. I heard pounding on my bedroom door, followed by a deep voice saying, Open up, kid, before I kick this door down. I lost my nerve and made a rash decision. I made a break from my parents' bedroom window and slid it open. I must have made a lot of noise while I was doing it, because I heard the footsteps coming towards my parents' bedroom now. I looked over my shoulder and saw a dark figure appear in the doorway. Get back here! The man yelled as he ran towards me. At this point, I tried jumping out of the window, but the man grabbed one of my ankles. Luckily, I was able to move my feet and slip out of my shoe and I fell onto the small roof above my back porch. The man at the window jumped after me. I remember seeing a pair of boots coming right at me. I swear the man's feet would have gone right through me if I hadn't rolled off the roof at the last second. 
I landed awkwardly on my left ankle, but otherwise, I was okay. During all the commotion, one of the men ran downstairs to cut me off. Lumping on one foot, I made it to the backyard gate before the man grabbed me and threw me to the ground. I tried to yell, but the man covered my mouth with his hand as the two other men climbed down from the window. The three of them began pulling me back into the house. But before they could get me through the door, I heard the sound of police sirens closing in. The men all looked at each other. Shit! They dropped me and ran towards the back gate. I limped my way to the front door and yanked it open and yelled at the police officers. Hey, they're in the backyard. Three of the officers ran towards the backyard while another helped me to one of the police cars. They managed to catch one of the assailants while the other two made it over the fence. They threw the man into one of the cruisers as I was giving my statement. Soon, the two friends I was playing online with pulled into the driveway on their bikes. Hey Gabe, are you okay? Yeah, I'm alright. Thanks for calling the cops for me. The man that was caught was charged with burglary and attempted kidnapping. It turns out that the men broke through the basement window. I'm thankful that I managed to escape with only a sprained ankle. My lesson to everyone listening is to always follow your gut and never ignore any sounds you hear while you're home alone. As luck would have it, I inherited a crappy piece of property in my early 30s when an uncle passed away. I know that sounds ungrateful, but if you had seen it, you would have laughed just like the rest of my family did. They teased me with countless haunted stories, due to the fact that the property was in a wooded area in the middle of nowhere. I decided that I might as well go out and take a look one weekend, but no one was available to go with me. Mom was afraid for me and made me promise to call every night, seeing as I left Friday afternoon and planned to come back on Saturday. I drove a van, so I had decided that I would sleep in it, even though there was a self-contained cabin there. Unlucky for me, I was advised that there was no running water, but I had already resigned myself to fixing the place up and selling it even if I got a low price for it. When I pulled up to the driveway on the four-acre property, I felt shivers going down my spine. I couldn't put my finger on why that happened, but I ignored it and continued to drive. The trees were so thick that I imagined myself getting lost, but soon I saw the cabin, which seemed too new to be in these shabby surroundings. There were a couple of abandoned old cars and a haphazard pile of rotting wood near the shed, which was next to the cabin. When I got out of my car, I felt icicles running through my veins. Maybe it was nerves, but I was sure I saw a shadow in the woods. I felt stupid, but I called out. Hello? Of course, nothing was there, and the shadow disappeared. I actually thought it might have been a bear, so I raced to the front door and fiddled with the keys, eventually unlocking the door and letting myself in. There was no furniture apart from an old table and only one old chair. It was obvious that my uncle started doing the place up, but his death intervened. Thinking of him, I worried that his ghost might be haunting the cabin. Little did I realize at the time, the scariest things were to happen outside. I started to wonder if I would stay at all, but found myself dragging my bags and air mattress in. I sat at the table and ate a makeshift meal, making mental notes about what I had to do to get the place ready for sale. Then I heard a metallic noise not far from the back door. I couldn't be sure, but it sounded like a knife or axe being sharpened. Fair enough, I do have an overactive imagination, but the sound was very real to me. Haunted stories usually don't scare me one bit, but when I looked out the back window, there was nothing to see at first. As soon as I moved to go back to the table, something caught my attention out of the corner of my left eye. 
I gasped when I turned back and saw what I thought was a huge, hulking silhouette staring at me from the edge of the woods. It was too small to be a bear, but why would there be a person out here in the middle of nowhere? I moved over to the window and had a second look, but it was gone. I could have kicked myself for not bringing a weapon with me. I didn't even have a multi-tool gadget. Even though I am female and was quite tough at the time, I had been a tomboy all my life. I always had tools on me, but all I had at the time was a flashlight. Deciding not to be brave, I stayed in the cabin and wrote notes in my journal. I froze when I heard the metallic sound again. This time I was sure that it was inside the cabin. I got up and nervously crept around, saying, Who's there? Believe me when I tell you that I jumped out of my skin when a shadow walked past the window. The frightening thing was, I couldn't tell if the shadow had been in the front of the window or outside. In a panic, I ran over to the window and once again, I saw a huge silhouette closer to the cabin, but still at the edge of the woods. Rooted to the spot, I stared and barely blinked, trying my best to see if it was real. It seemed like hours went past, but eventually, I had to blink. When I did, the shadow disappeared. I really thought a crazy man was watching me, and I decided that I had to leave. But what if he was waiting for me outside? I gathered up my things and ran to the front door, but I stopped when I heard something fall over in the next room. Was he inside? I had no way of knowing, and I did not want to find out. I opened the door and ran as fast as I could to the car. I was so grateful when the engine started immediately. While driving off, I looked in the rearview mirror, and I swear, I could still see the outline of a person. But when I slowed down for one last look, they were gone. It might sound odd, but I actually gave the property away to my dad, who hasn't had any issues there at all. I don't do much writing when it comes to stories about my own personal life, so bear with me as I take you on this weird, scary, and absolutely awful experience that was my life for two months in 2015. The best place to get started is by giving a little background. My two friends and I decided we wanted to rent a house in LA since we all got jobs in the area and had dreamt of living together after we all got out of college. We got a pretty decent price for rent that was split between all of us, but also thought that if we had one more person as a roommate, the rent would be perfect. It was a four bedroom, three bathroom house so we had the space and my friend Molly said she knew someone who needed a place anyways so it would be perfect. We all met her and got along great in the short amount of time we spent with her, so we all agreed it would be a good fit between the four of us. Our new roommate's name was Dove, and for the first month that she lived with us, she was amazing. She did her share of the housework, and honestly, for the most part, she stayed pretty much to herself. She never had people over and never complained and was generally one of the sweetest girls I'd ever met. We all used to talk about how lucky we were to find a roommate as great as Dove. That was until she met the man that become her boyfriend, Ty. The first time she brought Ty over to the house, the three of us were shocked. He was covered in tattoos, including his face, and he reeked of marijuana and just had the worst attitude of anyone we'd all collectively had ever met. Dove, on the other hand, either seemed not to notice or didn't really care. She took him into her room and thankfully we didn't see either of them for the rest of the night. The next morning, we woke up to our TV, vintage stereo system, and our freaking microwave completely gone. Obviously, Ty had done this since he was the only person in the house besides the four of us girls, and we were livid. We banged on Dove's door until she came out and confronted her about it. Instead of denying it like we expected, she told us that she'd actually just given him the stuff. He said he needed it, and she just told him to take it. She didn't see the problem and got mad at us for yelling at her for allowing him to just steal our things. She said she'd replace what was taken, but that was never really the point. We decided to forgive her, but told her if she was going to continue living with us, she couldn't have Ty over again since he was clearly terrible. She didn't like that, but agreed. 
A week went by and nothing of significance happened. Then one random Tuesday night when the three of us were watching a movie while Dove was out, we heard the door open and to our shock, in walked Dove holding the hand of Ty. She walked right by us like we told her the week before meant nothing to her and slammed the door when they got into her room. We decided on spending the night in the living room to possibly prevent him from taking anything else, but not even that worked. On his way out, Dove told him he could take whatever he wanted from the fridge. He grabbed a grocery bag and practically acted like he was shopping as he took most of what was in there as we yelled at Dove that he was not allowed to take our stuff again. They ignored us like we weren't even there. Neither of them would even look in our direction. Ty just walked out of the door, and we stared as Dove made her way back to her bedroom saying nothing as we asked her to explain what was going on with her lately. It didn't take long for us to realize Ty had gotten her hooked on pills and was just her hookup. It's why she never said no to him. To her, it seemed like getting what she wanted was all that really mattered. We watched for months as she deteriorated in front of her eyes, and the three of us had to move everything into our bedrooms to make sure it wouldn't get stolen in the night and installed locks on all of our doors since Dove and Ty constantly had random druggies come over to our house. No matter what we did or how much we begged, Dove refused to see things logically or from our point of view, so we did what any sane person would do in a situation like this. We waited for Ty and his friends to come over, and we promptly called the police. They told us to leave the house before they got there, and we went to our neighbor's house and watched out the window as an actual SWAT team arrived and raided the place. Ty and a couple of his friends were arrested for multiple different things involving drug possession and sales, which we did mention, but we never expected this kind of reaction from the police. Dove was let go since Ty took the blame for everything. We were relieved. We thought maybe this would mean that Dove could finally kick this habit, get some help, and just be done with that monster. They did end up searching the whole house, including our bedrooms, and the place was a disaster by the time we were allowed back in. Dove was irate. She screamed at us and told us that we ruined her life. We tried telling her that she needed to get help, but she refused and said that she'd be moving out as soon as possible since we had apparently betrayed her. We felt bad for her in the situation that she was in, but we were all kind of relieved too. Now a couple of weeks after Ty's arrest, we were all hanging out in the living room not expecting what was about to happen. All of a sudden, the door burst open, and in came four guys wearing blue and black ski masks. They ran over to us as we were screaming and grabbed the three of us as one went into Dove's room and pulled her out as she was kicking and screaming. They dragged us outside, put us in a van that was waiting outside with the driver as the rest of them piled into a car behind us. I was positive the neighbors had heard what was happening and all I could do was hope that one of them had called the police. Once we were in the van, one of the men took our phones and told us all to be quiet. He drove for at least an hour with no words spoken until the van pulled over. They opened the door and threw us out. We were standing in the middle of a dirt field as they tied our hands behind our backs. Dove seemed the calmest as we all were beginning to beg for our lives. They told us we shouldn't have ratted out Ty and that we'd be paying for it with our lives. We all started to cry and beg and plead, but Dove, she seemed like she was laughing, and she started cracking up and calling us babies for crying. She told the guys to untie her hands and that it was a funny joke, but that she was over it and just let us go. Instead of doing what she said, one of the guys just decked her really hard in the face and told her to shut up, and she hit the ground hard and then started crying herself. I actually believed then and there that I was going to die. These men were going to murder us and that would be it. I was just hoping that they'd find my family so my family could maybe get some closure from my death. And those were the thoughts that I was thinking. Begging wasn't doing anything. We watched in horror as the men who had taken us began digging these large holes just in front of us, and I was sure that that's where we would be buried. Just as I had started to come to terms with the fact that my life would be ending that night, in the distance I could see flashing lights speeding towards us, and I burst into tears. We were saved. The men tried to run, but it was a big dirt field and there was nowhere for them to go. The police officers got over to us, untied our hands, and thankfully they were able to apprehend all four men, and we were escorted to the hospital. We didn't have any serious injuries, so we were let go that night. 
We all eventually went to my mom's house just outside of LA and waited to hear from the police about what was being done to ensure these men stayed in jail. They were all charged with kidnapping and assault as well as conspiracy to murder. All four of them ratted on each other as well as Ty and their sentence ranged from, and I kid you not, 17 to 25 years and we were glad this meant none would have the chance to finish what they started anytime soon. I guess that night was a wake-up call for Dove, as she was also arrested and tried for being an accomplice. All of my roommates have kept in contact, except obviously Dove, but we agreed we didn't want to live in that house after that happened. I still live with my mom. Molly and our friend Jenna live together in a small apartment in LA, and we all get together from time to time for lunch. I have PTSD from that night and still get nightmares about it. I'm just glad I have my parents to help me get through it. And I urge anyone to be there for their friends if they notice red flags alluding to drug abuse. Even if they say they aren't ready to quit, sometimes just knowing there is a person that cares means more than you'll ever know. I hate dogs. Please don't be mad at me when I tell you that. I'm not some psycho who thinks dogs don't have souls or they're evil, I actually used to love dogs. I was so excited when I moved in with my buddy who had four of them so you could imagine I was a little disappointed when he told me not to interact with them. He said that they were only tame around him and his girlfriend and if anyone else came near them they'd quote unquote freak out. It was a little scary to think about four very large dogs who hated me living only a wall away but... My friend was usually pretty good about locking his door when he left or putting them out in the backyard if he was going to be gone longer than a day or so. One summer, my roommate said he and his girlfriend were going to visit his family a couple of states away and that he'd be leaving the dogs in the backyard for a few nights. He had automatic feeders and the dogs had access to this weird pedo-activated watering system so there was no need for me to go out and give them anything. The backyard was pretty huge and he assured me that they'd be fine and out of my way all weekend. I felt safe knowing that they'd be out of the house. No one was able to control those dogs except my roommate, so keeping them away from all the people while he was gone was definitely the right move. The day came where my roommate and his girlfriend left. I woke up and went downstairs for some coffee and looked out the sliding glass door at the four dogs as they stood there staring at me. Now these were all huge German shepherds, so seeing them growl at me but not being able to do anything about it kind of made me laugh a little bit. I went through my regular morning routine and got ready for work. I left the rest of the day and came home around 6pm after going to the gym. As I entered the kitchen I noticed something was very wrong. There was glass all over the kitchen floor and the sliding glass door was shattered. And that's when I started to hear the growling coming from behind me. I didn't even have to turn around to figure out what the sound was coming from. I did what any smart person would do and ran as fast as I could up the stairs into my room. The whole time I was running it felt like that dog was going to latch onto my leg at any moment. I slammed the door shut behind me and grabbed at my pocket to get my phone out and call 911. Except it wasn't there. The pocket was empty. I wanted to cry when I realized that I'd left my phone in my car and my gym bag. I felt so stupid. And you're probably wondering why I didn't just call for help outside the window. Well, I would've if we didn't live a mile from the next house. My roommate insisted on living in the country so his dogs could have a big yard to run around. I was really regretting moving in as I sat there wondering what the hell I was going to do to get myself out of that situation. I didn't even know where the other dogs were. I had only seen one when I made my way upstairs and I guess I could have overlooked them in the panic. Maybe the others were chasing me too. I leaned against the door and sat there for a few seconds before bang. Something huge and heavy was smashing itself against the door. Growling came soon after and I quickly realized the dogs were actually trying to get into my room. I didn't know if they were rabid or something, but I couldn't just sit there and wait for them to get to me. With the progress they were making on the door, I knew that they'd get to me at some point. The banging didn't last long before the scratching started. It was even louder than the banging and would quickly grant them access into the room if they continued to tear at that door. It was clearly very flimsy. I ran into the connecting bathroom and closed the door behind me. Listening to them scratch and gnaw their way through my door was mental torture. Getting ripped apart by dogs was not the way I wanted to leave this world. There isn't a single moment in my life where I wished I had access to a landline until that moment just then. 
I heard the door finally giving way, and the dogs finally enter my room as they growled and barked. It was the kind of growl where, even without seeing it, you could tell that their teeth were showing. I still couldn't tell how many dogs were out there, I just knew that it was more than one. I tried my hardest not to move or make a sound, but the sweat on my hands made a squeaking sound when they slid across the floor as I tried to get up. My heart dropped and I knew I was screwed. They started their assault on my bathroom door and I had no choice but to get into my bathroom counter and climb through the very small rectangular window about three feet above the sink. I squeezed myself through and laid on the roof out of sight of the dogs in case they got into the bathroom as well. Hours went by before they got in. I felt safe though, and this was the moment I realized that I had an injury on my left calf. The adrenaline must have worn off because the pain was getting worse by the second. I pulled up the leg of my pants and revealed a pretty severe bite along the back of my leg, and I kept wondering how long I didn't notice when that happened, but there was no changing anything then. Thankfully, the bleeding had mostly stopped, but I still wrapped it up with the flannel that I was wearing. I didn't need it exposed to whatever was on that roof. It was obviously the only choice I had was to wait on the roof for my roommate to get home a couple of days from then. I couldn't jump down because the dogs would get me. If I did jump down, I wouldn't be able to drive away because my car keys were downstairs in the house and I wasn't going to risk going inside again. I was safe on the roof and that was all that mattered. I didn't have food but thankfully there was a spigot only a few feet from where I was sitting. It was a considerably large house and the spigot was installed to easily hose off the roof if needed. I never knew what that was necessary for but I of course was grateful to have access to water for the next couple of days that I guess I would be spending on that roof. The hunger wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. The worst part was hearing the dogs make their way through the house at night looking for me and thank god they never found me though. My friend came back Monday morning and was shocked to find me on the roof. He gathered his dogs in his bedroom and helped me back into the house. When he found out what happened, he begged me not to tell the police or animal control. But I had no choice. One of his dogs had bitten me and they were so vicious that if they ever got out, I had no doubt that they probably would kill somebody. I went to the hospital and was treated for the bite wound and I was advised to get the rabies shot treatments and wasn't too happy about that, but it was smart so I went along with it. The dogs were impounded and after evaluation it was ruled that they would be humanely euthanized. My roommate blamed me for having his dogs killed, but I can't say I regret their outcome. I feel like lives may have been saved by them being euthanized. I try not to blame the dogs since I've known so many amazing shepherds in my life, but I do have this trauma. It turns out the sliding glass door had been broken in by a tree, pushed down by the strong winds earlier in the day after I'd left for work. Most large dogs scare me now and I can say that I don't particularly like dogs in general anymore because of this incident. It's disappointing but oh well. I got my two cats and that's perfect for me for the time being. Hopefully one day I can find the love for dogs I once had. I think the real moral of the story is to not move in with a guy who is open about having aggressive dogs. The story took place when I was an about 8 years old, so it's a bit blurry in some of the details. For context, I'm a female, and I used to live in a condo up in Montana, so I shared a backyard with all of my neighbors, and we were all very interactive with each other. Since this took place around December, there had been piles of snow sometimes reaching 5 foot tall next to our driveway from shoveling that I would use to sled down. Now, in our old neighborhood, most of the kids' ages were ranging from around 5 to 10, except one, whom in this story I'll call Robin, since it is close to his name, but for our privacy. Robin was 14 years old when this took place, so almost everyone was half his age. Robin was not out of the house much, but when he was, I noticed he was very aggressive to all of the kids. Like, he would actually literally body slam kids and even pick on them for being weak. I hadn't seen him much. As I last previously said, he wasn't out of the house much, so I hadn't really talked much with him. Robin was nice to me, but not as nice to the boys in our neighborhood. Because of the fact he was older, he basically saw himself as better than us 
if that makes sense. More or less like the top dog. He used that against everything. And really, I kind of dreaded seeing him. But one night specifically, I was out later than usual working on building an igloo with all the snow from the driveway. I was at the downspout trying to knock the ice off the gutters when I saw him coming up to me. I was a little annoyed since I was out at night just to have some alone time, but I brushed it off. Soon he came up to me striking up a conversation and he showed me how to knock the ice off. I said thanks and grabbed my sled and showing him to my snow hill, but he was not very interested in what I had to say. I can't exactly remember how the conversation led off to this, but he had started talking about random things that he had done, such as kissing girls and other kind of sexual stuff, like all the things he had done in school bathrooms and with other people. I was weirded out, but really just kept sledding down the hill and listening. By that point, he had moved behind the small hill that I had been sledding down. He then started kind of pacing around, and he then said, Hey, I have a question. But before I had a chance to reply, he then said, Actually, never mind. It's too dirty. But for some reason, this didn't strike me as odd, which really makes me want to slap myself to this day. But I still asked him, No, tell me. He kept this loop going for almost a minute, saying that he couldn't or that it was too dirty for me. Then he had broke. I wasn't expecting anything that bad, but then he said, Okay, fine. I was gonna say, let's play a game of rock, paper, scissors, except that if I win, then we have to kiss. But if you win, then we don't have to unless you want to. I then froze. I was shocked, since he was literally twice my age. I sat there for what felt like 10 minutes, but was actually about 3 seconds. Luckily, I thought quick enough and said, Okay, wait, hold on. I have to grab something. And I shot up and ran to my door. I then cracked it closed and sat there for about 10 seconds, not knowing what to do. I didn't feel safe outside anymore. I then went back out and I told him that I had to go inside because my mom said it was too late, which was a lie. Surprisingly, he just said okay and then we said our goodbyes. I went inside and I went and sat near my mom who was working on her computer. Now I have anxiety, which only made this worse. I thought that if I told my mom then I would have gotten in trouble for asking him what he meant when he said all that. But then, after a while of sitting there, I realized that I should just tell her since I can never even keep anything to myself as I'm a loud mouth. I expected her to yell at me and get mad, but she really just turned to me with a concerned look and was very shocked. That was very relieving for me since I was literally shaking in fear. In the next few days, I had to talk to some police officers about it. He moved a few months later, and I have no doubt that it's to get a fresh start and to get away from the problems. I can understand why this doesn't seem scary to others but it's really scary as an eight-year-old with anxiety, and also with the fact that I was always so unsettled near him. His presence was very uncomfortable from the start. Now, I'm really sorry for the lack of detail, since this was quite a long time ago, but parents, listen to your child if they tell you something like this, and always be aware of who you're talking to. Thanks for listening. My story started in 2014, when we had to move out of our rented seafront flat that we liked a lot. I was 28 then. We got about two months notice to find another place. We didn't have many options. We found a house which was converted into three flats. We shared a tiny hallway with our neighbor. The flat was newly decorated, but pretty much as soon as we moved in, we noticed that there were many things very wrong there. The back door's lock was broken. Because of this, the kitchen was full of bugs and slugs, and we reported it to the agency. A guy came out to fix the lock, 
and he asked me if I had met my new neighbor yet. I said no, I hadn't. He then said, he's a very weird guy. Later on I met him. Yeah, he looked weird. I couldn't tell if he was 30 or 60, but he was always very quiet and polite. One day though, funny enough, it was April 1st, and we went home after work with my boyfriend. Our neighbor and his friend was just leaving the house. My friends were supposed to come over that evening. We had quickly cleaned the house, and once we finished, we sat down. Then, I heard a weird banging noise from the neighbor's flat. Someone was coming down the stairs, and it sounded like they had dropped a really heavy bag. But then I heard it again, and again. They cannot be this clumsy, I thought but I didn't think much of it. Soon after this, I saw my friends arriving through the window. I went to the main door to let them in, and I then saw blood everywhere. A bloody handprint on our door. I was shocked. I then told my boyfriend that there was blood everywhere. Close the door, he replied. Then, I had heard my neighbor saying to me that, I stabbed the woman who regularly visits me in a very calm voice. I closed the door. The woman was laying in the middle of the road in front of the house, not moving at all. By this time, the ambulance and the police were at the scene too. They took my neighbor, closed down the house, and the whole street as well. We were then told that we weren't allowed to use the hallway as it was a crime scene, so we couldn't leave the house for a while. I had noticed blood coming down from the drain pipe too at the backyard. God knows how. About five weeks later, the police were knocking on our door, asking if we saw our neighbor as he had left the hospital and they're very concerned for his safety, and they asked us to contact them immediately if we see him. The light in the hallway wasn't working for a while, so I asked my boyfriend to have a look at it as I didn't want to bump into the neighbor in the dark. He went outside and took it apart. We later found out that it wasn't working because it was on the neighbor's electrical circuit as his electricity was turned off. While we were in the hallway, unexpectedly, the neighbor opened his door to check what this noise was. We were shocked. When did you come home? We asked. We didn't hear you coming in. It's because I didn't use a key. So if you lock yourself out, just ask me. I can open the doors for you. I guess this was the moment when we were truly scared for our lives. He then explained that he came home because he feels completely normal and he felt like he shouldn't be in a mental hospital. He didn't want to kill that woman. He just stabbed her in her thigh because she provoked him. Keep in mind, the police never confirmed anything to us. They just said that it was close to a murder investigation. We went back to the flat, and we were too scared to even call the police, as it would have been pretty obvious that we reported him. Later that day, the police came back and took him, and they told us off in front of him because we didn't report him. We never saw the neighbor again after that, and to this day, I still have no idea what's going on with him. The other issues with the house became severe as well, so we moved out as soon as it was possible. We now refer to that house as the Horror House. This happened nine years ago. I had just ended a four-year relationship and had moved into an old building in downtown Paris. I had to start all over again from scratch. Well, I did the mistake to let my ex-girlfriend keep a lot of my furniture, kitchen cutlery, pans, coffee machine, etc. At the time, I had worked as a waiter, so I could only afford a one-room apartment from a council estate building. It was really old and barely even clean, but at least I had a roof over my head. The first two weeks, nothing had happened, but quickly, I began to hear someone talking at night. It was kind of like mumblings. It basically said, just go and die already. When I looked into the door Judah, I saw a scrawny shirtless guy smiling and scratching the door with his finger. This became a thing every two or three nights. He would come and threaten me through the door or sing songs with a really childish voice. 
I thought about opening the door and asking him what he wanted, but I was afraid that he had a knife or something, and I couldn't see his hands while looking into the door Judah. What really stunned me is that he acted totally normal whenever I stumbled upon him during the day, and he actually denied being the one to do this at night. I even got mad at him for it, but he seemed to genuinely not understand what the hell I was talking about. One day I came home with a girl that I would met at a bar that I was working at. For some reason, she had left during the night, and I went back to sleep. The mumbling started again, only this time, it felt really close. I opened my eyes, only to witness the scrawny neighbor now headbutting the wall and singing what sounded like a mix between religious chants and also a lullaby in slow motion. I was honestly totally paralyzed by the fear. I tried to communicate with him, but he was just grinning and he ended up exiting the apartment by himself. I decided I had enough and finally decided to call the police. They took him in alright and he ended up getting put into a psych ward. Apparently this guy had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and he was put in a psychiatric hospital because of it. He wasn't supposed to live at his place anymore. He had apparently ran away from the hospital two months ago. He initially got sent into the psych ward after bashing a shovel into a postman's head, putting him into a coma. He did that for absolutely no reason at all. I never saw him again, and I moved out two years after that. Was there ever anyone in your town or neighborhood that your mom and dad warned you to stay away from? For a lot of people my age, there's almost always someone they were warned about during their childhood. For some, it's a neighbor or a certain person in town, and in some more sinister cases, it's a teacher, maybe even an uncle. But for me and the rest of the kids in our small Yorkshire town, it was John Cutter. Cutter, as we used to call him, was said to live in this old farmer's cottage a few miles out of town. We'd see him around town every so often, but he'd never talk to anyone, and that was a fixture in our town. Everybody rabbiting on to everyone else. A five-minute journey to the shops for a pint of milk might well take a half an hour depending on who you met along the way. For that reason alone, going anywhere with my mom was a huge pain. She'd stop and talk to almost everyone we walked past. But not Cutter. Never ever Cutter. For years I really didn't think anything of it. But what I do remember is going into town one day to buy a football with my mom. As we were walking back down the high street I disobeyed my mom and started dribbling it back to the car. At some point I lost control of it and it ended up rolling down the high street and stopping just outside a pub. I ran to collect it, and by that point it was sitting right at the feet of none other than John Cutter. Uh, can I have my ball back, please? Cutter just stared at me, and then looked at the ball, and then back at me, not saying a word. I remember thinking that he mustn't have heard me, so I asked him again. Immediately after, I feel my mom grab me by the arm and march me away. She drags me all the way back to the car park and starts telling me how I'm never, ever to talk to that man ever again. I didn't think I'd done anything wrong, but here mom was telling me off worse than when I'd smashed the neighbor's window. The whole way home, I cried my bloody eyes out, but the message was loud and clear. Stay away from John Cutter. Then... Around my teenage years, right when I was getting into that whole rebellious bugger off mom and dad phase, I ended up seeing where Cutter actually lived. It was an absolute mess, but that got me thinking that the reason no one liked Cutter was because he was just poor, a socially awkward and a bit scabby looking fellow. I thought the same thing about the kid in school other children used to bully, and I always felt just sorry for him. It wasn't his fault he had allergies and his nose was always runny and minging. And to me, the grown-ups in our town were doing exactly the same thing to Cutter. Not that I launched some campaign to change his image or anything. I just saw it as the oppressive conformist majority singling out and excluding someone who didn't live in the exact same way as them. Like I said, I didn't act on it. It just made me angry. So, in May of 1996, I'm 13 years old. I'm in my second year of secondary school, and it's almost the start of the summer holidays. I finished school on Friday afternoon and as I'm making the short walk home, 
I noticed there's an unusual amount of people and cars out on the streets at a time when it was normally just us school kids. So I've already got this sense that something isn't quite right as I hop the back gate of my house and walk round to the kitchen. Stepping inside, I'm greeted by the sight of my mom sat at our kitchen table. She's on the phone with someone, a box of Kleenex with a few used tissues around, and it's evident that she's been crying. I asked if she's alright. She hangs up the phone, then tells me something terrible has happened. Every year, once the weather turned nice, the local primary school would take its year sixes, that's fifth graders to you Americans, down to an old abbey not far from town. It's one of the oldest in the entire British Isles, so it's a huge tourist trap, and it's a big source of pride for the people around town. I'd taken part in the trip when I was that age too. Not most kids' idea of fun, but there were definitely worse school trips to go on. That Friday had been that year's year six turn to go down to the Abbey. About 50, 10, and 11 year olds were bussed down there in the late morning, and one didn't come back. Her name was Jenny Campbell. She was 10 years old and the entire town went into a frenzy trying to find her. That's why the streets were so busy. Word had gotten around fast and people had just headed down to the Abbey in their droves to help in the search. When the sun started going down, my dad and uncle ended up going down too with torches and whistles. I went to bed hoping poor Jenny would be found, at least so everything could go back to normal. But by the next morning, things only got worse. Overnight, a volunteer rescue worker had found Jenny's coat in some woodland not too far from the abbey. Police were appealing for witnesses to come forward, scouring the area around the abbey with dogs. It was like a blue and yellow circus had come to town, honestly. Police cars of all different sizes were driving through town all day and a load of them were basically camped outside of Jenny's parents' house. But they didn't find her the next day, or the next, and after she'd been missing for a full week, I think people started to assume the worst. Less and less police seemed to be hanging around town, and people were definitely talking about it much less. Not so much because they weren't thinking about it, but because the idea of little Jenny not coming back was just too much to bear. I understood it was a really serious thing, but being the daft 13 year old that I was, all I could give a toss about was the fact that I hadn't been allowed to play out for an entire week. Not long I know, but to a kid that seems like forever. So when my mom and dad finally relaxed enough to let me play out with my mates, we had an absolute field way with it. What followed was basically stand by me, but if it was set in 90s Yorkshire, although I feel like I should assure you from the get-go that there were no close calls with train bridges and no one found any dead bodies. For obvious reasons, my mom had forbidden us from going down to the abbey, but tell a teenage boy he can't go somewhere, that's just basically planting a seed right there, and as soon as one of my mates suggested that we go look for Jenny, that was all it took for us to march on the abbey. For me, it was when a mate of mine said, what if we find her, just at the last minute and we save her from dying? We'd be heroes, boys. Heroes. And you know what? He was right. I couldn't understand why people haven't found her yet, how the police could just appear to stop looking when a little girl went missing. So, off we went looking for Jenny Campbell, and for our sins, we found her. Right when we reach the forest near the abbey, I tell the boys to hold their horses for a minute while I run off for a wee. After I'm done, I hear two people walking through the trees, only from the opposite direction my mates are. Two thoughts go through my head. One, what horrible prank have they got planned since they're sneaking up behind me, obviously, while I'm half done? And two, how in God's name have they managed to sneak around and approach from a totally different direction? I do my pants up and turn around, already in the middle of saying, what kind of bloody woof does are you? sneaking up on me while I'm having a... But when I see who it is, I'm stunned into silence. It was Cutter, and he's holding the hand of a little girl who looked exactly like Jenny Campbell. John Cutter, the local pariah, the one people made nasty rumors about, he was about to be a hero. Cutter, you, you found her. It was the first and last thing I ever said to him. Not quite loud enough to alert my mates apparently, but loud enough for him to hear. 
He hadn't actually seen me until I spoke, and when I did, he and Jenny stopped and turned to look at me. It was only then that I noticed how Jenny didn't seem very happy to be rescued. She looked exhausted, pale and terrified, with cuts and bruises all over her arms and legs. Maybe she was just too shaken up to feel celebratory just yet. If she'd been out there for a week on her own, there's no telling what she'd had to do to survive. Then, Cutter spoke in a low voice, addressing me by name. I have no idea how he knew what my name was, and I was stunned into silence for the rest of what he said, and I'm guessing you'll see why. It was a long time ago, so this might not be exactly what he said, but it's the gist of it. You're Johnny, aren't you? He said. I just nodded. And you live on that cul-de-sac near Dodd's farm, don't you? Again, I just nodded, noticing that he was holding Jenny's wrist a little bit too tight. And your mum, she works in town, doesn't she? In that little charity shop, all alone in the daytime? I just nodded. I didn't really know what he was getting at, but it was certainly having its intended effect. You're going to tell everyone I found the girl, he told me. Because I did. Didn't I, Jenny? Jenny just flinched when Cutter said her name, and he had to repeat himself to get a response which amounted to nothing more than a whimper. Jenny's been lost, you see. Say the little thing wandered off on that school trip and she'd been sleeping in the woods all on her own, all week. Isn't that right, Jenny? Yeah, Jenny said, and the way her eyes fell made me think that wasn't quite the truth. So if you're going to say anything else, little lad, whose mom works all alone in that quiet little charity shop, if you're going to go telling something different, that'd be a lie, wouldn't it? And if you were to go telling lies about me, that'd make me very, very angry. Cutter continued to just stare me out until I nodded my head and murmured in agreement. Good boy. No excuses. This little girl had missed her mommy and daddy very much and I think she'd like to see them. And with that, he walked off, leading Jenny by that unusually tight-looking grip. I wandered back to my mates who promptly asked me what had taken so long. When I told them, I wasn't all that surprised that they didn't believe me, not first anyway. But when I gave them this attitude of, you just wait and see, don't take my word for it, and they saw I wasn't lying. So, Cutter found Jenny Campbell? Who'd have guessed? One of my mates said. I guess he's going to be the hero now then, isn't he? The three of them started going back and forth about how he deserved it after all. If he'd been the one to actually find her, that definitely deserved some credit, didn't it? It took me a minute or two to actually find the words to say it. Like you have to understand how conflicted I was. Shut up and let him take the credit, and I'd get the biggest I told you so moment over my family. Speak up, and I'd be defending someone genuinely evil. But I had to. What other choice did I have? I had this strong sense of morality. I couldn't possibly back someone I thought was guilty of God knows what. Guys, I remember saying, I don't think Cutter found her. Well, who did? I think... There were a lot of words I could have used, a lot of ways I could have phrased it. I opted for the one that kept my delicate sensibilities intact. I think Cutter took Jenny Campbell. I then had to explain to them exactly what he'd said to me but with added emphasis on the way he said it. I might have been young, but I wasn't stupid. Something was wrong, but it wasn't like I was in a position to say anything. If he was psycho enough to take a little girl like that, he was psycho enough to hurt me or my mom to keep us quiet. But then again, if I didn't say anything, he might go on to hurt someone else. The census was clear. Go to the police as soon as possible. Tell them everything and then get whatever protection me and my family might require. 
but I'm ashamed to say that when I got home, I just completely bottled it. I'd have to start the whole thing off by admitting to mom that I disobeyed her, and then I'd be following it up with accusing the bloke who rescued Jenny Campbell of being something I can't even say here. I got it into my head that it'd look like I was trying to make excuses for myself by making what was the worst accusation possible. It wasn't looking good for me, so I bottled it up inside. I just went upstairs, tried to take my mind off it, and failed miserably in the attempt. On top of that, I could barely sleep. I mean, could you if you were faced with that kind of dilemma? So that night, about one in the morning, I sneak out of bed and grab a cigarette from my little stash of them under my bed. I open up my window and sit, actually quite dangerous now that I think about it, right on the edge so my room doesn't end up smelling of smoke. Needless to say, the nicotine didn't really help with the stress, but I was feeling moody and angsty, so it suited the aesthetic, I suppose. Then right as I'm smoking, someone walks underneath the streetlight just down the road, someone who looked creepily familiar. But I'm thinking, it can't be him. It really can't be him. But it was. It was Cutter, and he walked right past our driveway and looked right up at me as he did. I was only leaning out the window for like five minutes tops, and I don't believe in coincidences, so I'd be willing to bet it wasn't the first time he'd walked by my house. I was so scared that I almost fell out of the window trying to clamber back inside before he saw me, but it was no use. He knew where I lived. I was relying on Jenny Campbell telling whatever truth there was to be told, but when word actually did get around that he was the hero that found her, I found it more and more difficult to speak up about what I'd seen, or rather, what I suspected had happened. They didn't exactly throw him a parade or anything, but there was a story about it in the local paper, and a mention on a regional nightly news channel. The hype came and went in about a week or two, and although Cutter didn't get any more social after the fact, people's attitudes around him definitely changed. Then that was it. For years. The story remained the same, and neither me nor Jenny had anything else to say about it. At least until Cutter died, and then it all came out. I could probably write a whole nother report about how the whole thing happened, but let's just say it was ugly. Really bloody ugly. A lot of shouting and screaming, a lot of tears and a whole bunch of regret. A lot of people told me I should have done things that I'm not sure they'd have done, if they were in my position at least. That was probably the most frustrating part, trying to explain to my mom that I kept my mouth shut about it. For her. And I suppose that brings us to the moral of what happened to me, or rather mainly to Jenny, and to the whole reason I wrote this up in the first place. It's always, always better to tell the truth and face the consequences of something than to keep your mouth shut. My dad explained it like a bank account. He put the truth in a box and hide it away, only it will accrue interest for as long as it's hidden, until one day you let that truth out, and it's bigger and badder and more hurtful than it ever could have been otherwise. His way of explaining it summed things up perfectly, and if I could go back and do things different, I would. I'd be much, much braver and just tell the truth, so that we'd all feel that some semblance of justice was done. I'm a 14-year-old female. This happened during English two weeks after the summer holidays ended. We were learning about Charles Dickin when some kids in my class pointed at some guy on a bike doing willies past the classroom, and he was looking into the room. Our teacher just told us to ignore him and carried on with the lesson. Five minutes go by, and a girl in my class suddenly screamed and pointed out to the guy who was now next to the window I was sat next to, but he quickly biked off. Our teacher pulled the blinds down and turned the lights on to carry on with the lesson. I had asked to take a time out outside next to the set of stairs that led up to the language rooms. When I sat down next to my girlfriend, I had heard a knock at the set of double doors on my left. I then hear a male voice who sounded around 16, asking to be let in, 
while also trying his luck with the door handles. Luckily, they were locked as always. I went back into my classroom, and my teacher informed me that our head teacher had called the police and that they were now on their way. We were starting to pack up for our next period when we then heard bangings at the windows, and I heard the same voice from the doors yelling some random words and cussing at us. The bell rang for next period, and the banging then stopped. Time skipped to when I meant science in the middle of a practical, when my best friend then pointed out that there were police outside. Our chemistry teacher came over to have a look herself. So apparently the guy from before sped off after we made eye contact. I found it a bit creepy as I was on the other side of school, and then now that's where he magically appeared. I later found out from my girlfriend that the guy had been appearing on school grounds for the past two weeks, but nobody had mentioned anything about it. She also mentioned that apparently the police noticed he had a weapon on him. To this day, I still dread to think what would have happened if those doors were unlocked. This happened around December of 2019, at seventh period on my last day of the semester. Our school had a basement and led to other classes that kids would try to get into because they were apparently really easy and had the best air conditioning. We had a test on that class and got done quickly because I found it very easy. I decided to text my friend who we'll call Cole to get a pass and meet me in the bathrooms to have vapes. I asked the teacher for a pass and met up with him in the bathroom. Just before we got out our vapes, Cole's phone gets a text message. The message then said that we're on a lockdown. Cole and I wanted to see what it was like in the halls. We looked, and it was almost pitch black out there. The windows are only in the classrooms, but not in the hallways. We then thought then this must be serious. There was a man walking out there, and he didn't look like a worker or a janitor. We went into the bathroom, turned off the lights, and then hid in one of the corner stalls. The room was completely silent. We then heard the bathroom open and close. The noise of him walking went to the stall that we were in. Cole then said, Dude, we have to crawl out from the stalls. The room was so silent that even Cole's whisper can be heard from across the room. The guy's breathing stopped, and we heard the stall being pressed in. I said, Dude, go! Go! And then crawled through the stalls. The man was now full on banging the stall, as well as yelling. The door then opened as we were leaving, and the light filled the room, and I saw that the guy was in the hallway. We pounded on the door to Cole's class until they opened the door. Cole then explained everything as the teacher locked the door, also mentioning a gun sticking out of his pocket. I didn't see a gun on him, but I just went along with it. Usually middle and high school students would laugh from making a scene like this, but the kids in the corner were quite scared and concerned. There was a bang at the door, and a few of the girls would squeal from fear. Cole, the teacher, and I saw the man at the door trying the doorknob and banged out of frustration. He then walked away and down the stairs. We have probably been there for about an hour or two at this point. The teacher instructed us to go outside in a single file where everyone would be greeted by cops. Cole and I tried to explain the guy's appearance to the cops and the deans. The cops patted us on the back and sent us home. After that incident... The school ramped up with security and added cameras. This never got any media attention, so we don't really know if the guy got caught or not. I'm absolutely convinced that guy's intention was nothing but to kill us. When I was in third grade, my history class took a field trip to an old mansion. I don't even remember exactly why we were there but it was kind of in the city and I think it was like 200 years old. We got inside and we were given a tour first. When I say it was a mansion, I really mean it was a mansion. It had two floors, a basement and an attic with about 10 bedrooms and five bathrooms. 
It also had lots of other rooms, like a library, several offices and living rooms, and a large kitchen. There was about 15 of us in the class, and after the tour, they let us look around on the main floor. They weren't watching us that closely, however, and I wanted to see the upstairs again, so I just walked up there by myself when no one was looking. Once I got upstairs, I noticed the smell that old buildings have oftentimes. I began looking at the bedrooms. I enjoyed history, and the house was actually very interesting to me. After looking at several bedrooms upstairs, I entered one on the end. I walked over to the window to see the view, but when I did, I heard a noise coming from the closet. I was a little confused and looked over at the closet. It was a really old closet and I didn't know what would be making the noise, so I started to open it, but then I really got the creeps and I decided to leave the room. I began to walk back out of the hall and when I did, I heard footsteps coming from the room. I turned around and what I saw was a man standing in the doorway of the room staring at me. He was wearing a black shirt, gray pants and just stood in the doorway and gave me a creepy smile. I turned and ran as fast as I could down the hall, downstairs and back to the group. I don't know who that man was, but I really don't want to know. When I was a freshman in college, I had to take a geology class. For the class, we went on a field trip for extra credit. I'm not the best at science, so I figured I should go on the field trip to boost my grade a little. We went to a park that I guess had many different kinds of rock formations or something. It was an old park and the professor gave us all a little checklist with a worksheet and after briefing us for a few minutes, sent us out to complete the worksheets. There was about 20 of us in the class and the park was pretty big, so we all spread out. I went with my friend John and we decided to go far out to fill out the worksheet. We went up a hill and over some rocks and started working. We were actually able to complete it pretty quickly as it was a pretty easy assignment. After we were done, we decided to explore a little. We walked for a few minutes and then came upon a large man that was walking down the trail. He approached us and told us that his friend had passed out and needed our help. He said his phone was dead and we needed to follow him quickly. Without hesitating, we followed the man. He started to run and so did we. After about two or three minutes of jogging, we came upon a little wooded area. The man stopped and said his friend was behind a tree. We didn't see anybody, however. We looked around for a couple seconds, but then to my surprise, I saw several men come out from behind the trees in all directions. They were all rather large, and one of them was holding a stick in his hand. The original man we were with then told us to give them our wallets and phones. My friend John told him no. A man then came up to John and pushed him to the ground. I tried talking to them, saying to relax. They then all began to yell at us. We were surrounded, and finally, I decided to give in and took out my wallet and phone and handed him to one of the men. John did the same. They then told us to walk farther into the woods. I knew we had to try to run away. I whispered to John to run when we had a chance. We were still surrounded, so I pretended to trip over a rock and fall to the ground. When I did, I acted as if I hurt my leg really bad. They yelled at me to get up, but I said I couldn't and they started to walk closer to look at me. At that point, the attention was taken off John and he turned and ran, and I got up and ran between two of the men. It was pretty close, but I was able to escape. They all began running after us then. We ran as fast as we could. We ran and ran, and we could hear the men behind us the entire time. Finally, we approached the hill we were originally at. We then started yelling, and the men had stopped chasing us. We got back to the group, but the men still had our phones and wallets. After reporting the incident, 
they were able to actually track my iPhone to an old house and two of the men were caught. It was the scariest field trip memory of my life. A few years ago, I took my grandma and her friend on holiday to Egypt. There were some really cheap packages for this resort town called Sharm El Sheikh, and they'd both been really poorly due to the cold weather over the winter, so I decided to do a good deed and pay for us all to get some sun for the week. Anyway, I booked the flights for February the 9th, and we flew out from Heathrow in the morning. The heat was just what they needed, and it was great getting to spend some quality time with them both. But after a couple of days, I started to get a touch of cabin fever. Like I said, my gran and her pal were content to spend the whole time by the pool, gabbing away and drinking non-alcoholic cocktails. Whereas me, on the other hand, I wanted to actually see a bit of the country that I came so far to visit. I wanted to soak up a bit of the culture, try some real authentic food instead of the o too familiar European-style grub they'd served at the resort. I also wanted to mix with the locals and... As the calendar drew closer to Valentine's Day, I found myself longing for a different kind of company. Now's the time where I have to clear something up. I'm a gay man, I was still in my 30s at the time, and I was also very much available. I'm also not one for the holiday romances or one night stands, so at first, I didn't even think about dipping my toe into the local dating pool. But as I said, around Valentine's Day I found myself playing the hopeless romantic and wondering if there was anyone I could share a bit of romance with at such a special time of year. It sounds sappy, I know, but I'm prone to a bit of sappiness, so you'll have to forgive me. Anyway, since Egypt isn't exactly known for its acceptance of gay or lesbian lifestyles, I didn't reckon that there'd be any bars that I could pop into for a bit of harmless flirting. So instead, I decided to see who in the area was on Tinder. I brought up the app changed my location and did a bit of swiping here and there throughout the day. There were a few tourists and only a handful of locals were brave enough to actually show their faces, but one did and oh my days was he gorgeous. He was tall, dark and handsome, every queen's dream, and his bio said that he worked as a resort manager. His English seemed really good from his profile so I thought that I'd swipe right and see what came of it. I really didn't think that we'd match. He seemed way out of my league, so I just sort of resigned myself to it not happening and started planning a little trip into the old town so I could check out some of the old mosques and stuff. I jump a resort shuttle into the old town, have a little wander around the market and all that, and I'm taking pictures of all sorts of amazing things as I go. Then, on the way back towards the shuttle shop, I walk past somewhere with free Wi-Fi and since I had all my data off to save a few quid on the phone bill, I took the opportunity to log on to the Wi-Fi so I could send Gran a few photos as if to say, look what you're missing out on. Then right as I'm trying to send a photo, a Tinder match comes through, and it's the Egyptian Adonis that I had mentioned before. I couldn't believe it. I was just staring at the match in disbelief, thinking this must be my lucky day. Then as I'm looking at the screen, he starts typing... A hello. This was it. We talked for about half an hour back and forth as I walked up and down the streets just beaming to myself. When I told him that I was only there for a few more days, he asked if I wanted to meet that night. If I give him a few hours to get home from work and take a shower, I could be around by 7pm for dinner and a movie. He asked if I like pasta, and oh my god do I like pasta, and then when I said yes, he said that he'd make me some fresh and homemade. I was ready to fall in love right there, and after telling him that I'd give him a text in a few hours, I headed back to the resort. Gran knew something was up. She could tell by how much that I was smiling when I got back. She was a bit slower to accept me coming out than my parents were, but she got there in the end, and by that time she was very supportive. So when she recognized a bit of glow about me, she had no qualms about asking me 101 questions while she and her friend giggled back and forth like schoolgirls. I told her that I'd be having dinner with a friend and that if all went well, that I'd be back in the morning. 
When they'd finished giggling, Gran and her friend got awful sweet about the whole thing, wished me luck, and told me to have a lovely time. The man I'd been texting, we'll just call him Mal, had given me the address of his flat near the old town. He said he couldn't offer me any wine, but that the pasta sauce was on the stove and he was very excited to see me. I was excited to see him too. Really excited, actually. Too excited to consider if maybe it wasn't such a good idea after all. But I didn't think. Or if I did, it was only from my little naive bubble where I couldn't possibly consider the outcome of such a thing. I wanted to meet Maul so much that it didn't even occur to me that he didn't exist in the first place. Things only started to seem off when I was actually walking up to his flat, when I saw what a state of disrepair the building was in. It wasn't exactly a wreck or anything, but all of Maul's pictures had made him look quite well off. That block of flats didn't seem like the kind of place a person like that would call home, but just the thought made me feel like I was being way too judgmental. The one moment of doubt I had, the one opportunity I really had to walk away and save myself, I just brushed off the idea like it was nothing. I followed my heart when I should have trusted my gut, and I ended up paying dearly for it. I found the apartment matching the number he'd given me and knocked on the door. There was a complete silence on the other side. Maybe it's a bit too hopeful of me to expect the sounds of smooth jazz and cooking when I arrive at the home of a potential date, but complete silence, hearing nothing, gave me the creeps immediately. Then, when someone answered the door, it was a total stranger. Not Maul, not even anyone who looked like him. It was just this chubby, bearded bloke who somehow knew my name. It was so confusing that I didn't even know what to say at first. I was scared that I'd been catfished or something. But then, the guy addresses me by name, then invites me inside, saying he's a friend of Maul's and that he'll be back in a few minutes. I'm still very hesitant to walk into his flat, and I'm still thinking of something's really off here, but then the guy suddenly said something that put my mind at ease. His English was good, but heavily accented, and he said something like, Don't worry, I know you and Maul have a meeting together. I'll be leaving when he comes back, I promise. He sounded as warm and welcoming as possible, and like I said, I actually found it quite reassuring at first. But the thing is, I might be an idiot, but I'm not a total idiot, so instead of going inside, I decided to politely decline. I told the guy that it'd be more comfortable waiting outside and that I'd give him all a call or something to see where he was. I thanked the guy, gave him a wave, and turned to walk back down the stairs, but I already knew it was too late. The look the guy gave me when I turned him down was chilling. He went from happy and smiley to completely expressionless in like a microsecond and part of me knew right then that things were about to go horribly wrong. As I got about halfway down the stairs, I heard shouting coming from above me. It was a man's voice, and he sounded very angry. I thought it was the man that I had been talking to, who was now fuming that his catfish had been rumbled, and out of fear that he'd started chasing me down the stairs a la Patrick Bateman, I started basically running down the stairs to get out of there faster. I hadn't even got to the bottom yet when I realized that yes, the man was actually giving chase, but when I got onto the street outside, there were two police officers standing right in front of me, like my guardian angels had suddenly materialized right when I needed them most. I started to explain what was happening in the plainest, simplest English possible, hoping they'd be able to understand, but as I spoke, I suddenly realized that they were not there to help me. They were both giving me these absolute death stares, and I remember shouting, wait, 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 as one of them pulled out this big wooden baton. After that, my memory gets a bit patchy. I know they took me back up into the flat that I just walked away from, but honestly, I couldn't tell you if I walked or if they carried me. The next solid memory I have was being punched and kicked while the man who answered the door asked me questions in English. I remember trying to answer them as best as I could at first, but I could taste blood in my mouth, and anything I tried to say just came out as a kind of groan. I spit out the blood so I could speak, but that just made them beat me harder. Then the questions turned to my sexuality and the reasons I had traveled into the old town that evening. In that moment, 
It wasn't quite like their whole scheme came together before my eyes, but it definitely was a big clue for me. The invite from Mall had obviously been some kind of trick, and although I was sadly familiar with the concept of gay bashing back in the UK, the fact that the police were involved in whatever was going on was absolutely terrifying to me. It's a testament to how scared I was that when they actually put some handcuffs on me and dragged me out to a waiting police car, I was actually relieved. I thought that that'd be the end of the beatings and abuse, and the beginnings of some kind of official legal process, but it was only half right. They took any opportunity they could to punch me, kick me, or throw me into a wall, and when I asked what I was being charged with, they told me simply, debauchery. I didn't even know what debauchery even was at the time, let alone that there was a law against it in Egypt, and the fact I was completely in the dark about the whole thing meant my nerves were stretched to a breaking point for almost every minute that I was in that cell. I only really got an idea of what was going on when a man from the British Foreign Office turned up to have a chat with me. I never thought that I'd be so happy to see another English person, and at first, just being spoken to like a bloody human being was such a relief that I had to fight back tears for a while. His name was Martin, and as much as first meeting him was a real boost, the news he had for me wasn't good. Basically, Egypt had made it illegal to be intimate with someone outside of marriage. They call this law Article 9 or something. Officially, its purpose is to combat what they call adultery, but unofficially, it's the law that makes being gay a crime in the country, and if you're charged with an Article 9 related crime, a conviction can mean anything from six months to three years in prison. Just hearing the words three years in prison made me feel physically sick, and I think I was just about on the verge of a panic attack before Martin managed to calm me down. He told me not to worry, and that the foreign office was leveraging the Egyptian government on my behalf. However, they needed something from me, too. They needed me to remain almost completely silent. I was to say nothing about my sexuality, and if they asked me any other questions, my only answers were to be, I don't recall, or my intentions were purely platonic. I was to repeat these two phrases until I was blue in the face, and if I kept stum, the police would eventually have no choice but to drop the charges. Martin talked like it was something he'd been through a hundred times, and that reassured me that everything would be okay, but also kept saying over and over again before he left, don't say a bloody thing. All this hinges on your silence. And he was right. But my god, did the Egyptian police use some dirty tricks to try and get a confession out of me. During the final period of questioning before they let me go, they told me things like, if you tell us you're gay and admit what you tried to do, we'll let you go. They tried acting so genuine, and it was sickening seeing how nice they could act, when all they wanted to do was put me in prison and slap me with a steep fine. I just did what Martin had asked me, and in the end, they let me go. I'd rather not rehash the reunion with my nan. Let's just say it was very emotional, with a lot of tears and a lot of apologies. I spoke to Martin briefly on the phone before we were due to fly home, and he assured me that no further charges would be filed. I thanked him for helping me, and he assured me that he was only doing his job, no different from all the other suits and ties that keep the wheels of government turning. But to me, he was so much more than that. To me, the man who appeared so calm and collected while I was at my breaking point, he was my hero. Even if he was the most unassuming hero, you could dream of. What I'm about to tell you happened last year on Valentine's Day. I'm a female who lives by myself in a small house about 10 minutes outside of a major city. I've lived in this house for about three years now after moving from an apartment in another city. I had been single for a while and I hadn't really been dating at the time. I was mainly just focusing on work, which was really busy at this time of the year. Then one morning, it happened to be Valentine's Day, and I got up at about 6 a.m. like I usually did. When I stepped out of my front door, I noticed that there was a letter on my front step with a rose on top of it. I picked it up and saw that it had my name on it, but no return address. It was strange because at this early in the morning, 
I knew that somebody had to physically bring the letter and rose to my front step and not just mail it. I took them both inside and was really curious to find out who this was from. When I opened up the letter, my mood went from happy to creeped out. The letter was typed out and started out by complimenting me on my looks and also saying I was really nice. Then it went on to describe some of my daily activities and eventually whoever wrote it said that we were meant to be together. However, they never left their name and there was no indication at all of who it was from. I took a photo of it and sent it to a texting group chat that I had with several of my friends, asking if one of them did it as a joke. I really didn't think they would do something like that, and sure enough they all denied it, but they did think it was pretty funny. I thought about all the people that it could have been, but I didn't really have any good ideas as to who it was. I decided to just move on and forget all about it. That night when I returned home from work, I once again saw something on my front step. There was a heart-shaped piece of paper, and it said on it, Why don't you spend Valentine's Day with me? I took it and went inside and called my best friend to tell her about it. We talked for a while, and it made me feel better. But a little while later, after hanging up, as I was in my living room, I heard a knock coming from my front door. It was nighttime by now, so it immediately got me suspicious. I went over to the front door, but nobody was there. I thought I saw out of the corner of my eye a man walking down the sidewalk in the other direction. Of course, I only saw him for a second, so I couldn't really give a description of him at all. I opened the door and there were no new letters or anything like that on the front step. I was now pretty concerned about whoever this was, but I didn't really know if it was grounds to call the police or anything like that. I hadn't been threatened or anything, so it seemed like it could have all just been a joke, and I didn't want to overreact. But still, I couldn't help but feel nervous about who it had been. I called my best friend back and she offered to come over and stay the night with me, which I said yes to. She didn't live too far away and was there within 15 minutes. There was no more activity the rest of the night, and the next day everything seemed fine. I went back to work like usual, and when I got home, I was happy to see that there were no letters or anything like that. I figured whatever had happened was just some Valentine's Day prank. I still wondered who it was though, but I was no longer really that concerned. But about two days later, as I got home from work, I once again saw a letter at my front doorstep. I got a bad feeling when I saw it. When I got inside, I opened up the letter. Inside the envelope, there was another handwritten note. It said, quote, I've been watching you. I hope you enjoyed my Valentine's Day card the other day. I also knocked on your door several times. And tomorrow when you get back from work, I will be back. I couldn't believe it when I read this, and I suddenly felt really freaked out like I wasn't alone. I ran straight from my front door and out to my car. When I was safely in my car, I drove to the nearest police station. I told everything to them and they ended up investigating and having an officer stay near my house for a couple of days. I don't think they ever found out who was behind it all, but I never had anything like that happen again. A few years back, I went on a date with my girlfriend on Valentine's Day. We went out to a really nice and fancy restaurant. The restaurant was one of those that was pretty expensive and you needed to make reservations for. You also had to wear nice clothes. We didn't normally go to such nice restaurants, but on the special occasion of Valentine's Day it was nice. Our plan was for after dinner to go to a movie. When we were leaving the restaurant and going out to my car in the parking lot, I saw there was a man standing kind of next to my car. I was parked kind of in the back of the parking lot, so I was sort of surprised to see this. The man was wearing a suit and saw me walking towards him but didn't say anything. I guessed maybe he was waiting for someone or something like that. He was probably about six feet away from the passenger side of my car, but when I got close to him, I said hi. The man didn't say hi back to me though. He just kind of looked away and sort of took a few steps farther. We got in and drove away to a movie theater that was about 10 minutes away. The movie theater was pretty busy, and after we had gotten our seats, I left to go to the bathroom. As I was walking down the hall of the movie theater, I saw the same man in a suit once again. He was just kind of standing near the bathrooms looking in another direction. He never looked at me at all, and as I got closer, I was sure it was him. I went to the bathroom and then walked back to the theater where my girlfriend was, and I told her about seeing the man. She thought that I was joking at first and started laughing until I told her that I was serious. 
We didn't really know what to make of it, but just hoped that it was a strange coincidence, and for the most part, we ended up forgetting about it. When the movie was over, we left the theater, and we didn't see the man at all in the theater or the parking lot. We got back to my apartment to watch some TV and have some drinks. I would say about an hour after getting back, as I was changing channels on the TV, my girlfriend asked me to come and look out the window. I walked over to it and looked outside down below. I lived on the third floor, so it was sort of high up, but not really way up there. I saw on the side of the road was the same man in a suit just standing there. Now I knew this couldn't be a coincidence. This time it appeared he was on the phone. I knew without a doubt that this was the same guy, and we were both really creeped out now. I had enough at this point and decided to go downstairs and confront the man. I left the apartment and walked down the stairs into the lobby. Then I went out the door to the street where the man was. But when I got there, he was gone. I walked down the street a little bit and looked all around. I couldn't find him, so I went back up to the apartment and asked my girlfriend if she saw which way the man went. She said that he walked closer to the apartment building, and then he went out of sight. This was concerning because to us there was a strong possibility that the man was inside our apartment building. It took me a long time to fall asleep that night, but nothing strange happened until I finally did fall asleep. I had dozed off at probably about 2 a.m., but was awoken to the sound of a knock on our apartment door. I quietly got up and walked over to it. I looked out the peephole, but saw no one. My girlfriend and I both knew it had to be the man in the suit, but what did he want from us? The rest of the night, there were no more knocks. In fact, we never did see that man again, but I always wonder who he was and why we kept seeing him. This happened last year, a few days before Valentine's Day. I was 18 years old at the time, and I was a very shy kid. It seemed that every girl I saw ignored me or just didn't really want to talk to me. Anyway, I was at a restaurant with my best friend at the time who I called John. We were talking about a bunch of different things, but mainly sports. Eventually, I asked him about some dating advice. I knew I could ask him about this sort of thing because at the time he had a girlfriend. I told John I was sick and tired of being ignored by every girl, and John told me to take out my phone. He took his out as well and told me about the dating site he used to meet his girlfriend. John helped me by explaining how to make a good profile and things like that. A few hours later, I was at my house in my room setting up the profile. I tried to find the nicest picture of myself that I could, and when I did, I used it for my profile. Then I used the app for a while and hoped to get some matches. I decided to watch some TV in my room after that, sitting on my bed, waiting for my phone to go off, saying I had matched with someone. I was skeptical and didn't really think that it would work, but after about just a minute, there was a ding from my phone. I grabbed my phone to look and see what it was. I saw the message was from the dating website, and it said someone had matched with me. When I clicked on it, I saw I had matched with a girl named Eva. I clicked on her profile and saw that there was a picture of Eva. She was my same age and had black hair and bright blue eyes. She was also wearing a blue dress, and she was smiling, showing off her bright white teeth. I felt myself smile. This was the first girl who I was about to talk to so I decided to send her a simple hello to start the chat between us. A minute later, Eva sent a hello back. We ended up chatting, and she seemed really nice. I then asked Eva if I could meet her in real life and not just chat with her, and she actually said yes. She told me I could meet her at her house, and then she gave me her house address. She told me I could come over that very same night if I wanted to. I said yeah and gave her a thumbs up. I stopped chatting with Eva and started getting ready. It was a bit cold outside that night, so I put some warm clothes on. I then grabbed my phone from my bed and hopped into my car. I messaged Eva telling her I was on my way over. As I was driving down the road, I kept thinking about how lucky I was I was going to meet a girl on the first night of using the dating app, and I was excited about what John was going to say when I told him about it. As I continued driving to Eva's house, I suddenly realized that the road I was driving on was becoming more and more empty and just woods. I passed by houses every several minutes, but there were barely any street lights, and it seemed that I was heading into the middle of nowhere. In fact, it took me almost an hour to get to her house. When I got there, I texted Eva telling her I was there and got out of my car. When I looked up at the house I was standing in front of, 
It looked like it would cave in at any second. I had a bad feeling, but I decided to keep going up to the front door. As I did, I noticed the grass that was in the front lawn was knee height. I sent Eva another message. I told her I was in front of the house and told her to tell me if this was the right address. She sent a message saying yes, she was there and to just go inside and call out her name. I grabbed the doorknob and let it slowly creak open walking inside the house. I noted that it was dark and dusty inside. I didn't see Eva or anyone else and then I tried to send Eva another message but the app wouldn't work. The Wi-Fi signal was down and I wasn't really getting any service on my phone. I decided to walk around to see if I could find her, so I headed into the living room. I saw a bunch of old furniture, and then I noticed hanging from the ceiling was a bright blue dress. I noticed it was the same one that Eva had been wearing in a couple of the photos she had on her profile. Then I saw a black wig hanging from the dress. It made me really confused because Eva's hair was black in the pictures. I called out Eva, hoping she would hear my voice. But just then, in the deepest and creepiest tone, I heard a yes from behind me. I nearly jumped and hit the ceiling. I turned around, but I didn't see Eva. The only person standing in front of me wasn't a girl. It was a guy wearing a black hoodie. He had the hood up and was wearing blue jeans. I noticed he had brown hair and he gave me a creepy smile and winked. I asked who he was, but he didn't say anything. He just pointed at the blue dress and the wig, grinning at me with the darkest smile that a human could. Then I noticed he had something in his hand. It appeared to be a gun. He told me in a deep voice to hand over everything I had on me. Then he pulled out a bag. I didn't want to argue with him, so I pulled everything out of my pockets and dropped them into his bag, even the watch I was wearing. The man then started to walk away from me. Pretty soon, I watched him walk out the front door. I was relieved, but also still terrified. Finally, I was able to get my legs to move again, and I ran out to my car as fast as I could. Luckily, I didn't see that freak again, but he had all of my stuff. I drove all the way back to John's house and told him everything. From there, he called the police, and when they arrived, I told them everything. As it turns out, the man who had lured me into the house was also pretending to be the Eva girl, and she didn't really exist. That's why I saw the blue dress and the wig in the living room of the house. The house also didn't belong to the man, and it was an old abandoned one. The scary thing is, the police never found the guy. But since it happened, I stopped using dating apps. Disgusted and repulsed don't even begin to describe what I felt toward my ex-roommate. She was really something else. Moving into the dorms your freshman year of college is supposed to be one of those fun experiences in life, something you look forward to all summer. Well, I look forward to it at least. Move-in day went well. I was a little disappointed when they told me that I wouldn't be having a roommate. I always envisioned my roommate becoming my best friend and doing everything together, but I guess that wasn't meant to be. The first half of the school year went great. I made plenty of friends and had gotten really used to having the room all to myself. When they told me I'd be getting a roommate in January, I was actually pretty bummed. I cleaned up the other half of the room to accommodate the girl that would be moving in and just hoped that we would get along. She came the second week of January when we had gotten back from winter break. She told me her name was Cassandra, but they should just call her Cassie. And Cassie didn't have much. She said it was because her parents never bought her anything and whatever she had, she had bought herself. I think she had maybe four boxes in total. I felt bad for her and told her that she could borrow some of my stuff if she ever needed to, but to ask first so I wouldn't think that I just lost it or something. And I quickly realized Cassie wasn't the average 18-year-old girl. She was different. First, she had horrible hygiene. I had to beg her a few times to take a shower in the nicest way possible because she would smell so bad that I actually would gag when I entered the room. She always thought it was kind of funny. She never washed her clothes, which also meant that the clothes that she would borrow of mine never got washed either. She would give me back my shirts with sweat stains and food covering the front. It was like this girl had never been taught any manners or basic social skills ever in her life. But the worst thing about Cassie was her obsession with eating raw meat. And I'm not kidding you. I walked in on her eating cuts of raw bacon one day, 
and she tried hiding it when I walked in, but there was no way that I could unsee that. I asked her why she was eating raw bacon, not to shame her or anything, but I just was generally morbidly curious, really grossed out obviously, but still curious. She said it was something that she'd always done growing up and that her parents ate raw meat too and that it was just a normal thing for her. I honestly thought it was completely disgusting, but I also was trying to be a good roommate and as nice as I could, so I told her as long as I didn't have to witness her eating it in front of me, I was cool with her keeping her raw meat in the mini fridge. I should never have said that. The next day I opened the mini fridge to find it full of pounds of pounds of meat. All different kinds too. Bacon, ground beef, different cuts of steak, and even some goat meat. When Cassie walked in and saw me staring into the fridge, she looked at me. She was smiling ear to ear, so proud of her meat stash. She bragged about the deals that she found, and before I could stop her, she reached in front of me, grabbed a package of ground beef, opened it up, and started shoving it into her mouth. I almost threw up right then. I was yelling at her to stop, and with meat still in her mouth, she just laughed. I reacted in horror when I felt bits of it land near me, and that only made her laugh harder. The next day I requested a room change. I couldn't take it, but I was told that that would only be possible in the next two weeks. I was fine with that as long as it meant that I could escape the nightmare that was this disgusting person known as Cassie. She really freaked me out. I told her she wasn't allowed to borrow my stuff anymore since she never returned anything in a good enough state for me to use anyways. She was upset, but seemed to understand. We didn't talk much the week after I requested a room change. She continued to stash all her meat in the fridge, but at least she wasn't eating it in front of me anymore. A couple of days before I was due to move out of the room, I was sitting at my desk next to Cassie when she walked out of the room. I got a call from one of my friends and leaned back as we talked. I was looking around the room when my eyes settled on her computer. One of the tabs had three words that read, Wanted fresh meat. I laughed and told my friend what I saw. He told me to click on it and see what it was because he was curious, and I never in my wildest dreams would have expected to see what was on there. When I clicked on the tab, my laughing quickly halted. My friend was asking me over and over what it was, but I was too scared to even speak. It was an ad that she had posted on a website I had never even heard of and the fresh meat that she was looking for wasn't from a cow or a pig or a goat. She had posted a wanted ad for fresh human meat. In the ad, she carefully explained how she liked eating raw meat and had always dreamed about what human meat would taste like. She seemed to be obsessed with it. One line completely caught me off guard and made me want to join the witness protection program immediately, and in it she said, eating human flesh has consumed my every thought. Sometimes I watch my roommate sleeping and fantasize about chewing on her. I took a picture of the ad on my phone and clicked off of it so she wouldn't notice I was on her computer. I grabbed my bag and headed out, telling my friend to meet me at the police station immediately. I told them everything and showed them the picture of the ad. In conjunction with the university and their concern, they spoke to Cassie about this, and surprisingly, she admitted to everything. They took it as far as actually testing all the meat in the fridge since we lived on campus, but thankfully, it was all either beef or pork. I was able to get a restraining order against her, and she was expelled from the university for apparently accessing the dark web while using the school's Wi-Fi and for attempting to engage in illegal activities. Now for a while, people actually compared Cassie to that German guy, Armin Maiwis, who cannibalized a person who volunteered to be eaten. Who knows if she really would have gone through with it though. I don't think Cassie was ever charged for what she did. I tried to distance myself from her as much as possible. Hearing her name five years later would still be too soon. After her arrest, I just never saw her again. I think she must have just moved away out of embarrassment for what she did, but she was expelled from the school, and the entire town knew who she was and what she did. There would have been no escaping the whispers and dirty looks and I do hope that she got the help she clearly needed. I still don't know how anyone could survive eating raw meat like the way she did. I ended up getting a new roommate after that who was perfectly normal, maybe even a little boring in some ways, but that was totally okay with me. I'll take boring over a cannibal any day.
What I'm about to tell you happened a little over a year ago, so it's still all pretty fresh in my mind. I was 18 and a girl in my class named Kendra was having a really hard time at home. Her parents fought all the time and she always talked about how much she wished she could just disappear. She confided in my mom, who was a teacher at the high school we went to, and my mom offered to let her stay with us. Only we didn't have an extra bedroom so that meant that she'd be staying with me as a roommate. I was really upset. My mom moved most of my furniture out to make room for another bed. Kendra was 18 too, which meant that she didn't have to get permission from her parents to leave, so she moved in pretty quickly. I noticed right away that something was off with her. She would spend hours sitting in front of the mirror, just smiling at herself. I would ask her what she was doing, and she always responded that she was practicing. Only, she wouldn't say for what. Most nights, I'd hear her in the bathroom talking to herself, seriously having full-on conversations, and it really freaked me out. But when I told my mom, she just said Kendra was awkward and having a tough time and for me to be nice. Kendra and I never became close. She made it very clear that she didn't like me. She ignored me constantly and would express anger whenever I'd hang out with my mom without her. Her jealousy turned into something really weird the day she dyed her hair to look like mine. She even went to the same hairdresser I go to and gave her a picture of me to go off of. She was open about it too. I continued to complain to my mom about her, now copying the way that I look, but again she told me to just be nice and put up with it because Kendra was having a very hard life. Weeks went by and the copying got worse. She would repeat everything I said, but in different voices, almost like she was trying to mimic the way I sounded. She started using my clothes too, and no matter how much I told my mom it creeped me out, she always told me to just go along with it for a while. I started feeling uncomfortable in my own home. I hated being in my room with her. The worst nights were when I would wake up to Kendra standing at the foot of my bed. Sometimes she'd be staring at me. She'd smirk when I expressed a sense of fear. And after a few months of her living with us, I decided to start sleeping in the living room to try to escape the awkwardness of sharing a room with a person I had started to believe was a legitimate sociopath. The living room proved to be not too much better though. She would still watch me sleep from the armchair across from the sofa and laugh when I woke up, scared of what she might do to me in my sleep. My mom never believed me when I told her what she was doing during the night. She told me Kendra always denied it and that I was probably making the whole thing up to try to get her kicked out of the house. I was done at this point. I decided one night that I was going to set up a camera to catch her in the act so I could show my mom and Kendra would be gone for good. That night... I set my phone on record and positioned it so it would hopefully be out of sight. I never expected to see what I saw the next morning when I went to check what I'd caught from the night before. I watched as Kendra slowly and quietly made her way down the stairs towards the sofa I was fast asleep on. She stood at the end of the sofa for a whole 30 minutes before she sat down in the armchair to watch me for another hour. Then she made her way into the kitchen. With wide eyes, I watched as she came back into the room with a large knife. She walked towards me and bent down to whisper something in my ear, and she laughed and held up the knife above her head like she was going to stab me with it. Then she brought it down quickly, but stopped, just away from my face. I screamed when I saw her head turn to look directly into the camera. I wanted to cry when I heard her say, You actually thought I didn't know what that was there? I know everything that happens in this house remember that. She then walked toward the phone and turned the video off. I immediately rushed upstairs to tell my mom but instead was struck in the chest with a wooden baseball bat. It was Kendra. I screamed at her and asked her what she was doing while trying to catch my breath but she looked at me with no emotion on her face at all. She started to drag me into my room and as I was in that daze from getting struck she began to tie me to the desk chair. She told me I didn't deserve the life I had. I shouldn't have been given a loving family when she was given an awful one. The goosebumps that went through my body confirmed what I was thinking when she said, You don't appreciate the life you've been given, so I'm taking it. I started shaking uncontrollably, begging her to let me live. She laughed and told me that she wasn't going to kill me. She was just going to live as me for a while. I didn't really know how that was possible, but I decided... It was best not to antagonize the crazy person right in front of me. And I was already pretty sure that she'd broken a few of my ribs with a bat and 
I didn't want her to pick it up again and continue where she left off. She dragged me, still tied to the chair, and put me in the closet and closed the door. I could still see her through the cracks and cringed when she put on more of my clothes and styled her hair to match mine. Finally, I could hear the sound of the door opening and my mother coming home from work. She called out my name and I started screaming for her to help me. Kendra opened the closet door and told me to be quiet or she'd hurt my mom, so I shut my mouth. I watched as my mom burst into the room and asked her where I was since she'd heard me calling for help. I started to feel sick when Kendra said, The mommy. It is me. My mom looked at her with pure confusion and asked her what she meant and Kendra kept repeating herself. It's me. Don't you recognize your daughter? I saw my mom's face drain of color when she asked Kendra what she'd done to me, and that's when Kendra had enough. She shoved my mother to the ground and screamed in her face that she was her daughter and she needed to act like it. My mom got up slowly and as nicely as she could, she says, Oh, oh my goodness, I, I don't know what's got into me today. Of course you're my daughter. Let's make, a, let's make some tea. Stay right there. She left the room and Kendra opened the closet door to tell me her plan was working and that my mom believed her. I of course knew that clearly wasn't the case and that Kendra had lost her mind. I was 100% positive my mother was downstairs calling the police, but I wasn't going to tell Kendra that though. My mom came back upstairs 15 minutes later and told Kendra that tea was downstairs and please join her. Kendra and my mom left the room and within seconds, I heard the police entering and her being arrested. My mom found me in the closet soon after and untied me. She immediately apologized for never believing me and in that moment, I was just happy to be in my mother's arms. Kendra was charged with assault with a deadly weapon at first but was deemed unfit to stand trial. Instead, she was sent to a mental facility where they'd assess her condition further to decide whether or not she should be a danger to herself or others. She was sentenced to spend at least three years in that facility before she'd have the chance to get out. All in all, the experience was truly a nightmare, but I also couldn't help but feeling at least a little sorry for Kendra. She was never given a chance in her life to grow into anything but what she became. She may have been the scariest roommate I'd truly ever had, but I don't blame her. I blame her horrible parents. If they had just given her the life she deserved, I doubt that Wherever her mental health started to deteriorate, it may have never actually gone down that route. A couple months in her stay in that facility, I got a letter from Kendra in the mail. In it, she told me that she was on medication and had plenty of time to think about what she did. She apologized and expressed how much she hoped I could forgive her. I actually wrote her back telling her I had already forgiven her and that I hope she continues to get the help that she needs and that there was no hard feelings between us. And even though I have forgiven her. I'd be lying if I said that there wasn't still a part of me that's scared of what she might do when she does eventually get out. My brother is a 16-year-old boy who's thin, weak, and short. On the other hand, I'm an 18-year-old male. I'm athletically built and tall. My parents had recently been hired for new jobs at our local clinic, and they were really struggling with time management. This left me and my brother most of the time home alone, which we understood, and we had no problem with it. However, one night in particular, I was obligated by my school to attend a camp that one of my extracurricular clubs was hosting in a different city not too far away. Ultimately, I decided I really wanted to go, as most of my friends had already confirmed they would be going as well. I decided not to tell my parents about the club. I mean, I'm already 18, and I believed it was unnecessary to ask for permission. Now that I think about it though, not asking for permission is yet to this day my worst decision ever. As night fell and my parents departed to their workplace, I began telling my brother everything he needed to know before I left that afternoon. He seemed hesitant at first, but soon realized I was extremely excited to finally leave our small town and explore something new. He promised everything would be alright and that he wouldn't tell our parents he'd be alone until the next morning. 
Before leaving, I acknowledged how selfish I was being and the potential harm that my brother could possibly face. I texted one of my friends who had previously told me she was willing to babysit as a side hustle. I explained the situation and immediately she agreed to stay over and watch for my younger sibling. I told my brother about the girl that he'd let in and the reasoning behind her presence. I felt relieved but still felt guilty. My ride showed up and I eventually left before the babysitter even arrived. Later that night, I received various text messages from my brother. However, I decided to ignore them as I was busy unpacking most of my stuff and those messages were probably weird and funny TikToks that he usually sends me. Well, around 12 a.m., I got a phone call from him. I silently picked up the phone, trying to avoid waking up everyone who was already asleep and instantly felt the world turn upside down when I heard loud crying and breathing. That was all I heard for the first 20 seconds until I finally called out again. Hello? Who is this? Are you okay? Finally, my brother replied. JJ, there's people in the house looking for the girl. She's hiding somewhere and they know I'm here. I'm scared. I initially thought it could be a prank as it sounded so weird and almost pulled out of a horror movie. Nevertheless, the crying and breathing said otherwise. I told my brother to stay hidden and to call the cops. As I was talking to him though, I had heard a gunshot in the background, followed by a sound of screaming and yelling. At this point, my brother had begged me to return and to call my parents. So I did, and I then explained as fast as I could. They immediately questioned me, but I told them there wasn't much time left and they had to go back home. Meanwhile, I was trying to get one of the teachers to drive me back home. Luckily, he agreed after hearing my very detailed story amidst my panic attack. Once I arrived home, there were infinite cop cars and many ambulances near the premises of our house. My brother was unharmed but in a shocked state. I apologized profusely and I tried to comfort him while being scolded by my parents. To this day, I'm unaware of the reasoning behind the events that unfolded on my house that particular day. No casualties were found, only several bullet holes around the house. I learned to not ever trust anyone or at least have a background check for the people I let in my house, especially when my little brother is alone. I'll be sure to provide an update if something else comes up. I genuinely doubt there will ever be one, as I reside in a small town and the police are sometimes not as helpful as we assume they are. Stay safe, and remember that sometimes not everything goes as planned. The moral of the story is to not be selfish. Well, for me anyways. My name is Thomas. One night, my friend for privacy reasons who we'll call Aaron was home alone for the weekend because his parents had left for a business trip. So he called me over and he asked if I wanted to have a sleepover. I had rode my bike around 7.30, entering from the back gate and from his back door, I had then greeted him and we ordered a pizza and played quite a few video games. We eventually got bored so we watched a movie. Halfway throughout the movie, we decided to ding-dong ditch a few houses. After many laughs, we head back to Aaron's house. After a few minutes, we had heard a banging coming from the front door. We were shocked, but when we opened the door and there was no one there, we had saw a note that then read, I'm coming for you. So we shut the door so fast, locking it from the top lock and the bottom one. Now, Aaron lives in a two-story house, so keep that in mind. Neither one of us knew what to do, but we calmed down after we stated it could be a prank on us from the people in our school because there was actually a prank war going on. So about another half hour into the movie, we both froze due to the sound of the front door then turning, when both of us just started thinking again about the creepy note we had gotten, when we both raced into his room which is on the second floor. Oh shit, dude, I forgot to lock the door. I said. As I said that, we had heard the back gate begin opening. Aaron was aggressively telling me to go lock it. When I went to the back door, 
I could then see a silhouette of about a six foot tall man looking inside through the door, but I don't think he saw me in return. Aaron had come down and caught up with me when I then signaled to him to go back to the room. We went into the room and we shut the door, but it had no lock due to his strict parents. I told him to call the cops and his parents, but he said no, that he wasn't allowed to have anyone over for the weekend and he didn't want to get in trouble so we had no choice but to hide under his bed. We began to then hear what sounded like the house being completely ransacked, things being thrown around and broken, doors slamming, etc. Then it got worse, even more terrifying than it already was. We began to hear footsteps coming up the stairs. Aaron's door then slowly opened. We had heard the closet open and then clothes being moved around. And then, he just seemed to stop. The bed we were hiding under had a huge blanket over it that hung all the way down to the ground level. So, unless someone moved the blanket, you couldn't see us. 20 minutes later, I'd asked Aaron, Dude, do you think we can run yet and get the f*** out of here? But then, before I could even react, Aaron was then immediately dragged from underneath the bed to which I then heard the most disturbing, ear-shattering scream which Aaron let out while being dragged from under the bed. It was right then and there that I knew I had to f***ing do something or someone was going to die that night. I got out from under the bed to see Aaron struggling to get loose from the six-foot psycho's death grip. I desperately searched the house to find something to use as a weapon. I found a screwdriver. I ran back upstairs charging towards the man and made absolutely sure I stabbed him and got the screwdriver fully through his back. He then let out a blood-curdling scream, letting go of Aaron. We quickly ran out to Aaron's backyard, which led to the very dark woods. We then hid in some bushes near the entrance of the forest. We saw the man leaving the back gate, now holding a knife, which I guess he took from the kitchen. I felt his eyes pass me, when Aaron then whispered, We gotta run. To which I then replied back with, Why the f*** would we run now? We've came this far. Might as well keep going. But dude, he's coming right at us. Aaron said. And he was right. The man was running straight towards us. I still to this day don't know how he saw us in the pitch black like he did. Aaron had lived in the countryside of town. So the neighbors were about one to two miles away, and the road was a straight path, so he could easily see us. My lungs felt like they were on fire, and I ended up falling because of a tree root sticking out. Aaron stayed with me, trying to pick me up, but the man was right behind us, and he was at least seven feet away from us. I could clearly see him in a tall black hoodie and white sweatpants. I don't know how, but this time luck was finally on our side. It seemed that this time he didn't see us. He then ran off in the other direction, and we sprinted even faster. I was the slower one, but I swear I could hear leaves crunching behind us. We entered the back gate, making sure to lock it. Remember before how Aaron was too scared to call his parents or the cops because of the repercussions of him getting in trouble? Yeah, well, that. I told Aaron to call the damn cops already, that it's gotten too bad. We need the help, and with much hesitation, we finally called them. I stayed on the lookout to see if I saw the man coming back. It was so dark out, and I couldn't see a thing, but I then did something so regrettably stupid. I shined the flashlight in the woods when I saw it. I saw his dark, tall silhouette. I thought he was going to run directly towards us yet again, but no. He just turned around and ran back into the dark woods. The cops arrived and they searched the property, but they didn't find him. They only found the missing kitchen knife he took. The cops claimed there was going to be an investigation, but with not much to go off besides the knife, I really doubt much was ever done. And if there was, we never got an update on it. My guess is the guy's still out there somewhere, wreaking havoc. But yeah, that's the story of how me and my best friend Aaron almost died while home alone together. Stay safe everyone, and make sure to lock the doors and windows at all times.
it just may end up saving your life someday. This event lasted less than five minutes, but was still one of the scariest moments of my life. My aunt and uncle, who were both major junkies, moved into our house when I was around nine years old. Though I really looked up to my aunt, I was always very uncomfortable around my uncle, who was to put in nicely the epitome of abusive white trash that one may imagine. He was skeleton thin from drugs, had a shaved head, covered in poorly done vulgar and racist tattoos, and to top it off, he had missing and rotting teeth. He was always drunk or high, and definitely wasn't good around kids. Well, one evening, my mother went out with my aunt, so my uncle was there, though he wasn't our usual assigned babysitter. Cass, my twin, and I had been taking care of ourselves and my little brother for years at that point, and we were certainly more mature than my uncle could ever be with all of his missing brain cells. Cass and I were hanging out in the living room while my brother slept upstairs in his room. My uncle suddenly came staggering out of his room, which was directly next to the living room. He squinted his eyes like he didn't recognize us. Now, we weren't afraid at all of our uncle, but we definitely weren't about to listen to him. Our uncle had then tried to kick us out of the living room, but we didn't have a TV in our room, so I'm sure that I said something that made him angry. More than likely telling him we didn't have to listen to him and that he had his own TV in his room. He marched back into his room, and I thought that was that. But then, he came back in holding a pillow from his bed. Before I could even begin to comprehend his intentions, he had stomped across the room and then pinned me to the couch, fully holding the pillow over my head. Even writing this, I can feel my heart pounding, and I'm having trouble completely catching my breath. I couldn't breathe, and I just remember throwing my hands about frantically trying to pull his hands off. I had bit my nails as a kid, so I couldn't even dig my nails into him. I was gasping for air and quickly losing consciousness when I then heard my sister screaming. I was about to fully black out when the weight lightened and I was able to throw it off, gasping like a fish out of water. Cass had jumped onto his back and he had flung her off panting hard with such a cold look in his eyes as he staggered back. My uncle stormed out of the house, cursing at us, and we immediately locked the glass bag door behind him. We sobbed and held each other, sitting in the middle of the living room. We fell asleep wrapped in each other's arms, and we only woke up when the front door unlocked and then opened a few hours later. We ran to meet my mother and aunt at the front door, but they were both drunk off their asses and were giggling and shushing each other as they staggered in. I knew that they'd be no real help now, but Cass explained and my mom was actually overly nice when she was drunk, so she then hugged us and began crying, telling us how much she loved us, which was a rarity. She and my aunt stayed up with us, them still drinking, and they turned on a horror movie and gave us each a shot. I know what you're thinking, but even at nine years old, we weren't about to turn that down. When my uncle began banging on the glass bag door at 4 a.m., my aunt staggered over and told him to go f*** himself and to sleep outside for the night. He didn't come back for three days, but when he did, he acted like nothing had ever happened and he avoided us like the plague. So dear readers, don't trust someone with your kid just because they're family, especially if they're family like mine. You never know what someone is truly capable of, especially in a moment of rage. This probably won't seem very scary to most, but it's one of the scariest moments of my life. If my sister hadn't have intervened, I truly believe he would have possibly killed me. Even more than 10 years later, I still wake up sometimes gasping for air like it may be my last. Back when I was a student, I used to work as a bartender in a nightclub here in Liverpool. Most places kicked out at about 2am, but we stayed until about 6am and just mopped up all the business that came spilling out of the other trendier places. This meant that we got some absolute messes propping up our bar on a nightly basis, and you could roughly divide the idiots that patronized us into four categories. One, happy drunks, occasionally annoying but generally favorable. 
Two, sad drunks, frequently annoying, tend not to tip. Three, sleepy drunks, usually have to rouse these buggers out from the warmer, comfier corners of the end of the night. And last but not least, the rare and mystical blackout drunks, totally unpredictable, avoid at all costs, removed from premises as soon as possible. When I say blackout drunk, I don't necessarily mean people who just got too drunk to stand up and end up passing out. No, blacking out when drinking is an actual medical thing. Don't quote me on the ins and outs, but from what I understand, some people have a very particular reaction to alcohol, not all the time, just some of the time, and it causes a complete mental break. People can do outrageous things and have no memory of it whatsoever. They have zero inhibitions, zero social cues. The car is driving, there's just no one at the wheel. Now you see how dangerous that can be and why I added the whole remove from premises type thing. So the stage is set for my scariest post-work encounter ever. It's been a quiet night. People are coming and going in dribs and drabs and we get this one guy who comes in dressed in what looked like work gear. He seems a bit worse for the wear, but more like he just had a rough day, so my colleague gives him the benefit of the doubt and gives him one last pint of lager for the road. Maybe an hour after, he's leaning up against the bar, staring into space, with this glassy, watery look in his eyes. Classic blackout case, not falling down drunk, still semi-lucid, but there's just no one behind the eyes. We're close to closing anyway, so I prompt the door staff to come over and ask him to leave. He seems a bit confused at first, but soon complies and he's out the door. No drama. We close, do a really quick clean down, and we're all out the doors about 45 minutes later. I usually walk all the way home since it's only a fairly short distance, and the area tends to be completely deserted at the time of morning. Only on this occasion, our blackout drunk friend is sitting on a wall on the opposite side of the street, just staring into space like they always end up doing. But as I'm looking at him with a bit of concern, wondering how he's going to get himself home, he looks up at, notices me, and then immediately starts crossing the road towards me. He doesn't engage though, he just stays behind me on the pavement, following at a steady pace. I'm getting increasingly frightened and I'm trying to keep my cool, but I can actually hear his footsteps getting louder and louder on the pavement behind me. So I pull out my phone and fake a call with my boyfriend, I was single at the time, saying I was about to catch the bus home. But uh, what's that? You want to come and give me a lift? You'll be here any second because you're already in the area? Okay, thanks babe, you're the best. Then, heart pounding, I walk about 50 meters to the nearest bus stop and plonk my butt down on the bench. Blackout guy hangs around for a bit, not looking like he's doing anything in particular, but I know what he's hanging around for, and it's scaring the bejeebies out of me. But thankfully, with a bluff of my boyfriend coming to pick me up, having apparently worked, he starts shuffling off along the road and eventually out of sight. Only trouble was, he walked the same way I needed to get home, but... It was no massive issue, I could just hop the first bus, it was due in like 15 minutes, and take the L for the bus fare, but I'd definitely get home safe and sound. Bus comes, I get on, take a seat, happy days. Next bus stop comes along, bus stops, only one passenger shuffles onto the bus and drops a handful of change into the little coin tray. I look up, guess who it is? It's Blackout Guy who without looking at me walks past and takes a seat just behind me. I'm just absolutely bricking it by this point and I've completely run out of ideas. I know the guy's going to get off at the same stop as me, follow me home, and then what? I lived alone at the time, I'd have been buggered. Out of pure nervousness I remember checking my watch and that's when I got the idea that saved me. Right by my flat, immediately as you get off the bus there's a Tesco Metro and since it was just past 7am, it would have just opened. That Tesco would have been rocking a security guard and possibly an office I could ask him to hide me in. It wasn't the best idea, but it was definitely worth a shot, and it turned out it was the best idea I could possibly have had. Like clockwork, the guy got off the bus with me and followed me to the Tesco. I was a bit shaky when I approached the security guy, but as soon as I explained what the deal was, 
He ushered me off into a security office where they normally detain shoplifters and all that. Police were called, and the blackout guy actually hanged around the Tesco, waiting for me to reappear, so he was an easy caller. I'm not sure if they charged him with anything, or just gave him a bed for the night. I don't care though, to be honest. He was out of my hair, I was safe, and that's all I was arsed about. I don't know if he saw through my fake phone call or something, but him working out that I was on that bus was honestly one of the worst moments of my life, like this proper oh no moment that I've never have repeated before or since. I just feel bad for girls who don't have anyone to run to when something like that happens. Girls who aren't as lucky as me, who don't get to go home, sometimes, ever again. I think I was about 19 or 20 when this happened. I was walking home after a night with the homies and since I was feeling jolly, or high should I say, I decided to take the long way home. The long way home consisted of walking down this big old boulevard with some really nice big houses on it. I think they were all built around the turn of the century and some of the ornate brickwork could make you feel like you've gone back in time if it wasn't for all the latest model Mercedes parked in the driveways. So I'm walking kind of slow, just sort of moseying down the middle section which has all of these flower beds on it. Like I said, it's a real nice place. So nice in fact that a punk kid like me in skate shoes, a beanie, and a black hoodie doesn't fit in at all. Which is why although I can't condone what happened next, I can kind of understand it. So as I'm walking, I'm like looking up at all the stuff carved into these strips of stone near the rooftops. Some got dates on them, some got carvings, when all of a sudden... I hear this dude like, Hey, hey you, what are you looking at? I look down to see this dude sitting on the front steps of what I assumed was his house. I'm just minding my own business, not doing anyone any harm, so I kind of reply defensive like, Nothing, what's it to you? His response to that is to just get up off his butt and start marching towards me. And only then do I see how monstrous this dude really is. He's huge. I must have instinctively started backing up like, whoa dude, chill, but he just keeps coming, gets right up in my face and starts growling these demands that I tell him what I was looking at. I just say like, the house is dude, what do you want? And then for some godforsaken reason, what I thought would be a totally harmless answer turns out to send him into what I can only describe as a fit of rage. I don't care how big or scary anyone is. I don't have time for drama like that, so I just keep backing up until I'm a safe enough distance and then start walking away. But as I'm walking, I hear this horrible distinctive click-clack that has me stopping dead in my tracks. The guy tells me to turn around, and my worst fears are confirmed. He has a gun pointed right at me, and he's telling me not to move. I've never been so scared in all my freaking life. Like I legitimately couldn't stop myself from shaking as the guy launches into a tirade about how his house has been targeted for burglary and blah blah blah. How the cops won't help. How guys like him need to take the law into their own hands. I sympathized. I totally did. I had my bike stolen when I was 12 by a kid that lived on my block. I had to watch him ride that thing around for weeks before he trashed it one day and just tossed it into the river. That guy was obviously at breaking point, ready to snap. The problem was, he was about to snap on me, and not an actual criminal. Thankfully, he calmed down a little, and after promising I'd never walk around that neighborhood at night anymore, he finally sobers up, lowers the gun, and lets me walk away. People make a big deal out of bad neighborhoods, and how you shouldn't walk through them at night. But no one tells you about the good neighborhoods, because let me tell you, they can be just as dangerous. It was back in the summer of 1974, and I was 16 years old at the time. I had just attended a concert in the city with my friends Dave and John. The three of us were catching a train home. We had got off at our stop, and we began walking home down the main road, chatting about the concert and still buzzing from the cool vibes. It was around 12 a.m. and we were crossing at a main intersection. There wasn't much traffic around this time of night, 
And as we crossed the road, we suddenly noticed a beat-up brown-colored station wagon stop in the middle of the intersection right near us. His window was down and the driver was around 25 to 30 years old, and although he looked a little dodgy, we just assumed he was going to ask for directions, and so we just stood there waiting to see what this guy wanted, completely unaware of the sheer terror that was about to follow. In that very moment, the guy pulled out a pistol from his lap, and what he uttered next still gives me shivers to this day. He said in a calm tone, Who wants it first? We just froze in absolute shock and terror, and it took a few seconds for all the reality of this to finally sink in. We didn't even have time to exchange a look, and we all hightailed it across the intersection. As our footsteps thundered across the road, the sound of gunshots filled the air as we ran for those bushes. I was absolutely terrified waiting for that bullet to hit me or one of my friends in the back. As we ran further into the park and mustered up the courage to look back, we could no longer see the car and breathed a sigh of relief. We all just stood there trying to get our breath back. Luckily, we all knew the area pretty well and we decided to continue along the old gravel road that we knew would take us back towards our homes. As we walked down the path, our conversation was pretty minimal, as we were too preoccupied of the thoughts of what had just happened and how lucky we were. However, that feeling of relief didn't last very long. As we got near the end of the gravel road, I could make out a car at the very end, and I started to wonder to myself, could that be the guy? We kept walking, but then just like out of a scary movie, the car flipped on its headlights and started revving its engine, and under the dim lights of the street, my heart began to sink as I then realized it was the brown station wagon. We knew he could see us. He was waiting for us. Taunting us. He must know these streets well and where each of the different roads would lead. Well, we didn't waste another second. We took off once again and jumped the fence of a neighboring house. We didn't stop, we just kept running and running and jumping all of the fences. I glanced toward the road many times and I would see his car screaming past. Each time we made it to a main road, we would see his car appear again and once again speed towards us, and we dove over fences and tried to find another way. This happened about two or three more times after that. Around 1.30 a.m., we got down the end of another side road, and we couldn't see at the time, but the fence we jumped was covered in barbed wire, and it tore our clothes as we slid down. I let out a few groans as it grazed my arm. We were now in some kind of paddock-type area, and we could faintly hear the screeches of his tires racing around trying to find us. We just stood there crouching in the dark, breathing heavily, standing in cow manner, but we didn't care. We probably crouched for about 15 minutes or so, just waiting in the dark. Figuring by now he must be gone, we made our way back onto the main road. We kept our eyes peeled and kept glancing over our shoulders, and as the headlights appeared in the distance on many occasions, we each stopped breathing for a second wondering in anticipation whether or not it was going to be the brown station wagon. We didn't see him again after that, and around 3am we walked my friend John home. Dave came back to mind for a bit so we could talk more calmly about our experience. Dave went home later that night. What was only meant to be a 20 minute walk home turned into that I will never forget. What was even more scary was a week or so later, I heard on the news that an elderly lady was shot by a random stranger one late night not too far from where this happened. Whether it was the same guy or not, I'll never know. All I really know is that my friends and I were incredibly lucky to escape that night. I live in a relatively safe area in Scotland, though I've had several really odd and scary experiences since I moved here about four years ago. I'm a short 29 year old woman and I work in a pub, so I often get out of work quite late. I never wear my headphones when headed home at night, so this particular night was no different than usual. Alarm set, doors locked and checked, then said goodbye to my colleague and then went our separate ways to get home. I usually cross a grocery store car park to get home, and that night something struck me as odd. There were a couple of cars parked there, which is normal, but something just felt off this time. I looked over my shoulder and I clocked a guy in a hat walking a distance behind me. This wasn't weird, but I decided to keep an eye on him nonetheless. I exited the car park to the main road that I lived off of, but still had a good mile or so to go before I finally reached my flat. I checked over my shoulder again and sure enough, 
the guy was walking in the same direction as me. The distance between us was starting to close, so I decided to cross the road. Looking over my shoulder, I was able to not only look for traffic coming, but I was also able to keep an eye on him. I crossed the road and didn't bother to look back for another few minutes, assuming he had stayed on the other side. But I began to hear footsteps approaching. I glanced over my shoulder and saw this guy was about 20 feet behind me. I had a soft drink in a glass bottle in my bag, and figuring I was overacting but better safe than sorry, I stuck my hand into my bag and gripped the bottle. Another 45 seconds and this guy was close enough to touch me, but he slows to my pace and then says, Hello there, how are you? I ignored him and I don't respond. I long ago gave up on pretenses of being polite if I feel uncomfortable. If I'm feeling uncomfortable, I really don't care about a stranger's feelings. But he persists in talking to me. Hi there, are you going to work today? No. I was being short with him. Are you going home? Yes, I said coldly. Do you live in this direction? I just looked at him, and he tried again. Do you live off this road? Where do you live? Do you live close by? I don't respond to him and I slowed my pace, letting him walk on. I was still gripping the glass bottle, ready to hit him with it should he try anything. He tried to slow down so that I would catch up with him, but I slowed down so much that I was barely walking. He was maybe 300 yards away at this point and simply stopped and turned around, watching me and waiting for me to catch up with him. I reached into my pocket with my free hand and tried to get my phone. Of course, my phone was dead. I figured it would last the walk home, but the dodgy battery had other ideas. Surprisingly though, I wasn't really afraid. He had started walking again, but again, still quite slowly. He looked over his shoulder again after another minute, and I seized the opportunity. There was a path to a block of flats that was obscured by tall hedges, so I leaped behind them. I waited for nearly ten minutes, never letting go of that bottle the whole time. I peeked around the hedges to make sure he was there. I peeked behind bins and bus stops to make sure he wasn't hiding, but as far as I could tell, I had lost him. Maybe he didn't mean anything by this, but if you suspect a woman is afraid of you and she's walking alone at night, don't speak to her. It won't help. And especially, don't ask her where she lives repeatedly. I wasn't drunk. I didn't appear to be drunk or need any help. I was just walking home like I usually would. I am, however, inclined to believe that he had bad intentions. I would rather be too cautious than not. So did that creepy dude who seemed to be following me home that night. Screw off. My name is Courtney and I was 23 years old when this happened. I worked at a McDonald's right near my house. In order to get to my house or to my work, you have to pass by a public park. I always carry pepper spray on me in case anything happens to me. I've been working at McDonald's for a few months now and whenever I would work, I would always pass by the park and nothing has ever happened until this one night. It was a Wednesday I believe and I had just gotten off from work. It was around 11pm and I was starting to walk home. The reason why I walked from work to home is because my house is close by so there's no need to drive. Anyway, while I was walking, I looked behind me for whatever reason and I saw a man in all black following me. I thought nothing of it and just simply kept walking. I looked behind me once more and this time I could tell that he was walking a bit faster. I walked faster too, hoping that this guy would go away. I felt like he could put his hand on me at any moment so I had my hand on my pepper spray just in case. And then it happened. I felt a hand cover my mouth and another hand grab my neck. I screamed and took out my pepper spray and sprayed the man of the eyes and he fell to the ground. I ran home while the man lied on the ground screaming in pain. I finally came home and went inside almost out of breath. But, unfortunately, it didn't end there. My parents weren't home, and when I went to look out of my bedroom window, I saw the man across the street looking right at me. He then ran off into the darkness, and I never saw him again.
My name is Matthew, and this is the most horrifying experience I've ever had. This was something straight out of a horror movie. I lived in a rural town in California and worked at a local Domino's. I have to walk past some woods in order to get to my house. I've been working at Domino's since I was 17, and I am now 19. I have also been walking past the woods, and nothing strange has ever happened to me. Until today. So, my shift at Domino's ended at 7.30, a bit later than my normal time I get out. So I'm walking, and I could see the woods maybe a few miles up ahead. Finally, I get to the woods, and I'm on the side of the road. To get a better idea of where I was, imagine a road and trees on both sides. Now, there are barely any cars or people on the road at this time. Keep in mind that it's getting dark and you only have very little light, so it really added to the creepiness. Anyway, as I was walking, I thought I could hear something coming from the trees. I looked, but I didn't see anything. I continued walking when a rock was thrown at me and landed right in front of me. I then turned around and looked to the trees and I could see someone waving at me. It was dark so I couldn't see who it was or how they looked. I asked, uh, hey, do you need something? He responded in a loud whisper and said, hey, come over here, I want to show you something. I told him that I had to get home and that I couldn't be late. He responded saying, oh, d don't worry, it will only take a second, I really need your help with something. I told him I'll help, but I only had a minute. He said a minute is all it will take. I took a deep breath and walked over to him. He said that he found a man-made hole dug in the ground and wanted to see what was down there and that he didn't have a light. I told him I would shine my light with my iPhone down there to take a look. Doing that was the biggest mistake I've ever done. I walked over and stood by the hole with the man behind me. Before I was about to shine the light, the man pushed me down the hole. I fell about 20 feet and landed on something soft. I started cussing and screaming at the man, but I didn't see him. I stood up and I could feel the soft thing I was on. I had to see what I was standing on. I shined the flashlight on my phone and shined it down. I felt like my whole world had been shattered. The light revealed the body. It was a naked woman who looked to be about 20 and she had been killed. She had cuts everywhere on her body. I stayed down there for a good half hour before finally managing to climb out and run home. I didn't tell my parents about what I saw. I only told a few of my closest friends. For a bit of background story, at the time I lived in a city in a not so great area in South Texas. I was walking home from my friend's house since my mom wanted me home by 10. To get to my house, you have to go through a tunnel. I've been through the tunnel before and nothing too strange has ever happened. I mean, you would see maybe some people doing drugs or something but nothing too major. However. This night was absolutely horrifying. I was walking through the tunnel when I heard someone falling behind me. It was some guy. There were some dimly lit lights in the tunnel so I could see him. He then started to walk faster towards me and when all of a sudden he came to my right and said, Hey, you're really pretty, wanna hang out sometime? This guy looked to be about 30 and I was 18 at the time so I politely told him that I was only 18 and that I had a boyfriend. He responded and completely ignored what I said. He said, so can I have your number? I told him no and to please leave me alone. He seemed to get the hint and so he walked back. While I was walking, I could see the end of the tunnel that would turn onto my street. Then, I felt two hands grab around my neck and squeeze tight. I tried punching the man and he let go of my neck and tried to grab my hands but I managed to cut him with my pocket knife. 
He then fell to the ground and screamed in pain. I ran as fast as I could out of the tunnel and onto my street. I then lost him and walked to my house. When I got inside, I fell to the floor, bawling my eyes out. I explained to my parents and they called the police, but they couldn't find the guy. I now carry pepper spray on me and my boyfriend sometimes walks with me through the tunnel. I haven't seen that man since, and I hope I never do. Christmas is a time of year to be happy, merry, and joyful, at least for most people. I love spreading cheer to family and friends on Christmas. My joyful mood usually translates to my coworkers as well. I work in customer service, which many people know can be a nightmare at Christmas time, so it helps to try and stay upbeat. Well, on this specific Christmas Eve, customers were doing some final Christmas shopping before Christmas Day. Right at the end of my shift, I cashed out a pretty normal looking guy. I would say the average height range of like 5'7 and maybe 150 pounds. He had parted black hair, glasses, and was probably in his mid-40s. He was buying some fairly normal stuff and not really anything Christmas related. The whole interaction was mostly friendly until the very end when I said something I now wish I didn't say. I ended our transaction by saying in my bubbly voice, Thank you, sir, and have a happy holiday. He stopped and turned back to me and said, What did you just say? I responded nervously and semi-confused. Have a happy holiday? He stormed back to my register and screamed at the top of his lungs, It's Merry Christmas! I backed away in a slight panic and just said, Okay, sir, I'm sorry. He walked away mumbling to himself, but I could tell he was furious by his recent actions. For a couple of minutes, I kept staring outside and I could see him pacing in front of the store, still seemingly mumbling to himself. A few people actually came into the store and said that there was someone outside talking about Christmas and Jesus' birthday. I began to panic, thinking this guy was going to come into the store again or wait until I got out and try to follow me home or something. Well, luckily for me, my boyfriend worked at the same store and he was driving us to my mom's house for a Christmas Eve party at the end of the night. We left shortly after six and at first I was relieved when I didn't see the man outside. We were almost to my boyfriend's car when we saw the man running after us from the side of the store. My boyfriend opened up the back seat door so I could hop in and he stood there in front of the car. My boyfriend said in a stern voice, Hey, is there a problem man? The man still in a rage said, That lady has no respect for Jesus or Christmas and she should be punished. My boyfriend, confused, told the man to back away and leave us alone, and the crazy man actually tried to jump past my boyfriend to get into the car to punish me or whatever that meant. My boyfriend slammed the guy down to the ground and got in the car and we drove off. Like fools, we decided on the drive not to call 911 because we didn't want to bother them on Christmas Eve, so we thought and just wanted to forget the event. On December 26th, we did alert our store manager of the situation so we could call the police if the guy ever came back into the store. I still work at the store, and almost a year later, I have never seen that man again. I can say for certainty that I will never say happy holidays again. <laughs> 